again, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience Podcast featuring me, Jim Cornette. It's a no bullshit zone alone in the wrestling podcasting world, an island of truthiness in a sea of suck ups and fawning fanboys, unvarnished opinions occasionally augmented with minor exaggerations for comedic or dramatic effect. Trademark. And. As you can tell, it's going to be one of those shows. So joining me in this, I'm cranky tonight, folks. He's a non-cheeseburger-eating, plain pizza-promoting, sausage-denying, New York water-trying food snob. His daddy was a pistol, and he's a son of a gun. Your friend and mine, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, I think. I don't know where we're going. This is uh, this is maybe my second favorite intro you've ever done. My first favorite was, I'm Jim Cornette and I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I would set the well, that, for the episode. That was more to the point. I'm just cranky. And you know why I'm cranky? Because it's later in the day. We are recording this program much later in the in the in the day than we normally do. And I think I mentioned the last time we did this. I've had all day for people to piss me off and the world to fuck me and a heaviness to just descend upon me. Today, I found out the the eight giant 15-foot-tall evergreens on my fence row in between me and a guy next door, so I have to look at his garage, that I just planted five years ago. They've doubled in size, big, bushy, beautiful green all year round, except now they're turning brown because of the atmospheric conditions that have been created by these science-denying Republicans, these fucking non-climate change crackpots. Louisville, Kentucky has had, the the past two years, the two wettest years on record back-to-back. That was followed last fall by the longest drought in 20 years. It racked my evergreen, my arbor vitae's immune system so that then they got susceptible to the fungal infection and two of them are just are gone we're we're gonna have last rites on them i'm gonna have a big hole there and the other ones are gonna be fertilized and and pampered but it's it's a hit and miss proposition some of them are good some of them are not i found this out today from my tree doctor you know my tree doctor dr vinnie boom bots and then moments later, you know, the, the individual, I won't mention any names, that used to manufacture and supply me with the fine T-shirts that I sell to the cult of Cornette members on jimcornette.com that I used to employ to do that thing sent me 12 dozen fucking T-shirts of caca because she decided to try out new equipment and new ink in a new location on my shit. So now the fine folks at Collar and Elbow are going to be handling all of our T-shirt production from now on, folks, and they are a larger business, and we have expanded. Uh, But uh, in in the meantime, over the next 7 to 10 days, if you order some sizes of some models of shirt, there may be a slight delay. Please excuse us. Uh, but otherwise, uh, at jimcornette.com, the uh, incredible 80-page full-color graphic novel behind the curtain is in full supply. The membership certificates in the Cult of Cornette, only $10 uh, on, on heavy card stock, 8 by 10s everything else, the action figures. Well, actually, there's below 300 action figures now, and they are the original version here that will be available in this calendar year, so... I can't say they're in plentiful supply, but we were in full stock, even burger towels for once. We've been able to stock up enough to keep them on the shelves. And here comes the T-shirts and caca. His research was caca. It's Frankenstein. Anyway, did I just do a plug there without even really knowing it? You're doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, but anyway, so I've had that going for me today. And then... And then I couldn't wait. Well, we won't be finished recording until 9 o'clock at night. I couldn't wait till 9 o'clock at night to eat this. So I ate early. And now I'm sluggish. As you can tell, I'm, I'm lifeless and listless and lethargic. Uh, because I, I had a, a, a light dinner, though. You know what I had? You know what I had, Brian? I had a couple of Johnsonville and Dewey sausage uh, dogs 
in cooked in the oven to a nice crispiness and then a toasty uh, uh, bun and some sprinkled some diced onions on that. And then I didn't have any cheese queso, which is easier because you can just spoon it right on. But I melted, I melted some grated cheddar cheese on top of that bad boy and then hit it with some barbecue sauce and mm, that's the all American hot dog right there. Barbecue sauce, cheese, onions, white bread. What more can, what, what, how much more American can that be, son? Sounds disgusting, and you're making me almost not want to eat my dinner, which I'm going to eat as soon as we're done. Well, I'll try to make this as long a show as possible, just to torment you. (laughs) Because I had to eat my dinner early, and I didn't didn't want to eat so much that I just had to go to sleep. But as you can tell, I may be listless for the rest of the program. I'm cranky and listless. Uh, We're going to talk about Raw tonight for the final time. At least they went out with a bang. Uh, We're going to talk about All Elite Wrestling, who actually... I'm going to say it right now, and let's just wait till later on for the content. The best television show I've ever seen him do. Really? I'm surprised yeah. by that. But I'll tell. Well, I'll tell you more about it later on. See, that's a tease to get people to fucking stay tuned, but it's true. And we've got some emails and some news and stuff. And the big news is that uh, uh, people are patroning us over at Patreon. Yes, they indeed yes, are. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm getting you to agree with me so that I can further elaborate. I didn't want this to be one side. It's got to be you and me, not just me, me, but you and me. <laughs> the people are patroning us over on Patreon to record numbers, and we've only been up like, like a fucking week, right? So this is good. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. Right now, we have several episodes from 2013, the beginning of the Jim Cornette experience and Jim Cornette's drive through up right now, as well as for Wait, but before it was even named the drive through when you just reminded me, I forgot that for like two or three episodes, it had another name. And you just reminded me, I still don't remember. I'm just taking your word for it. It was Jim Cornette's inbox, the creative. Well, you didn't have to tell them they could have fucking had to join and had to pay. So you've ruined the tease. Now you've given it away for free. Well, what we're not giving away for free, there are now four compilations of Jim's Cursing, swearing, and insults from four separate episodes of the experience. Some go 14 minutes, some a mild eight minutes of everything he can think of to say to insult someone. I, I think, I think here's the thing. I think that somebody ought to take those and get a, an incredible uh, stereo system in a, in a big jacked up custom truck or something that had some volume and go to Trump rallies. And just let them have it. If it's not even about Trump, they'd get the fucking picture. You know, but it would sound like just someone with Tourette's because it doesn't always make (laughs) sense. Sometimes (laughs) they're just thrown together. It's like, fuck, fuck, dick, fuck, fuck, dick spot, fuck, Grover. You know, just, it's all over the place. That's the thing. They'd they'd get the (laughs) idea. Hey, we were 17 years old, me and Bolin in LaGrange at his old hovel of an apartment over the dry cleaners on Main Street. 117 East Main Street, LaGrange, Kentucky, over the dry cleaner is where, and the dry cleaner's gone now, is where Bolin used to live. And on Oldham County Day, that was Main Street, right? And they would have a literally a parade. It was like it took two blocks for the entire parade to pass by, right? It, but so they just they circled around a lot. But they had the Oldham County High School marching band. They parked, stopped right underneath while we're trying to watch Lance and Dave on Saturday morning wrestling. They parked underneath the window and began giving a band serenade. And all the fucking horns and everything. And it sounded like goddamn Mayberry fucking symphony orchestra. And so quickly we rearranged the speakers to his massive stereo system to be pointing out all the front windows of the second floor. So we had a height on them and put on Casey and the sunshine band and turned the horn section all the way up of get down tonight so that it threw the goddamn high school marching band off and ran them to the next block down to hold the rest of their concert. Casey and the Sunshine Band. Incredible horn section, see? And it was throwing them all the fuck off because they were doing John Philip Sousa or <laughs> John Philip Law or somebody. Anyway, Silvano um, Sousa. Silvano Sousa. Uh, was he from Portugal or Uruguay? I'm not sure. He was a former tag team partner of John Arezzi's. I should ask John. 
Well, it, 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 when you do ask him if Silvano Sousa is going to be on the second season of Dark Side of the Ring, see, here's a segue for you. Well, we didn't even plug the actual address for the Patreon. Oh, ho, how do you get to the Patreon? <laughs> Patreon.com slash Cornet. All right, well, there you go. That's easy. Uh, no, I want the big news that we've been going to reveal to everybody and, and have been held back because they wanted to make the official announcement. But the second season of Dark Side of the Ring on Vice TV. You know, it used to be Viceland, but now it really is Vice TV. But I was calling it Vice TV all along anyway, because that's what you should fucking call it. And now that's what they're calling it. So on Vice TV this year, Dark Side of the Ring debuts March 24th, Tuesday nights. It's going to be 9 p.m. Eastern for the first week, which is a two-hour Chris Benoit episode, which I've been told is chilling as shit. And then every Tuesday thereafter, 10 o'clock Eastern for the hour-long episodes. Um, I'm going to be in a number of them, as you've seen in the trailer, but they're doing Owen Hart and the first first credible, legitimate documentary of any kind that I know of that's gotten Martha on record and on camera and her side and the family, her family's side of the story. Um, a, a new Jack, which is, tells me things about new Jack. I didn't even know. I thought I knew everything there was. No, how could there be more? There's more, uh, the brawl for all somebody might not come off looking too good. Uh, the road warriors, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we're going to have Evan Husney, the director on the program again, uh, here in the next, as soon as I call him actually. So Evan, I'm calling you. If you're out there, we've emailed uh, but he and Jason Eisner, the director, have done the same thing they did the first six episodes. Do you know a a cooler looking, prettier, more artistic, independent look at the wrestling business than what they did last season? I'm not sure. Well, that sounds very non-committal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they have the actual real legitimate TV production that only the WWE gets, but they actually try to tell, you know, the other part of the story. Anyway, I like it. You're hard to please. Uh, But anyway, we're going to be doing that and talking about that as it goes on. But that's the big news that has been released. Anyway, speaking of the coronavirus... Continuing to spread, but it will not be in Ohio or Kentucky in the next few weeks. We've had no cases of that, right? You haven't heard of anything. I've been keeping an eye on it. No, it's up here in New York now and uh, in New Jersey. There you go. Well, see, that's where all the sickness and illness is and comes from. Uh, But that's why I will be appearing in Ohio and Kentucky over the next couple of weeks. Uh, March 14th in Circleville, Ohio. For the Fan Fest and the big uh, wrestling event at the Heritage Center, the, at the fairgrounds in Circleville for Bobby Fulton. And uh, it, it just go to the website and look at the incredible array of superstars. New Jack is actually going to be there. Um, if, if, if he hasn't somehow assassinated poor Jason and uh, Evan for doing his dark side of the ring. Uh, but uh, the horsemen are going to be there. Me and the Midnight Express. And this will be the, the only uh, uh, event that I know of for me, Bobby Eaton, and Dennis Condry to be together in the same place this year. So that'll be March 14th in Circleville. And then March 27th through 29th at LexCon in Lexington, Kentucky at Rupp Arena Lexington Center with all the superstars and, and mega events of the, uh, of the weekend and no coronavirus. If uh, I am not traveling anymore for the rest until the coronavirus is solved, would you be nervous if you were a fan who got tickets for WrestleMania? I wouldn't be nervous. I'd be pissed because I'd see what the fucking WrestleMania card is. Right. <laughs> well, beyond that, just the coronavirus, and you're going to be no, in an area I, with whatever. I don't know how many people get in there. Eighty thousand people. Ninety thousand people. Yeah. No, I wouldn't be there anyway. I'd be a goddamn nervous wreck at the fucking thought of it. The only large crowds that I have ever really willingly gone into in my life were ones that paid to see me uh, in uh, on the card as a performer of some description or uh, behind the scenes employee or whatever. I don't I hate crowds. I hate the parking fiasco. I hate the goddamn walking around. I hate the fucking I'm always eyeballing what's the quickest way to get out. Uh, what's the quickest way to park, beat the traffic, blah, blah, blah. I, I, ha- I hate large groups of people. They're dangerous and filthy and, 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 and highly contagious. 
What? I'm not disagreeing with you in any way. I see on the fucking TV or the news or whatever, especially in, in, in China or in Japan now with the masks. If I got to go out in public to a place where I have to wear a mask to keep from catching something fucking deadly, I'm not fucking going. And conversely, if I've got something that I could give to people that is fucking is badass enough that I got to wear a mask, I should be beaten with a fucking sack of wet hammers for going out in public. And by the way, I don't think those masks actually are effective in doing anything from what I know. No, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. If it, if it, no, I, but I don't go anywhere anyway except to the post office. And I know there's a lot of international fucking packages coming in there. They're probably crawling with germs. I, I may die quicker than most people. But it, at least it's close to home. That's as far out in public as I get these days, and I have no desire to go anywhere else this the, the, for this uh, coming year. Anyway, speaking of your goddamn filthy ass n- northeast, hold on here. I have files I've got to bring up on you. Files. Wait a minute. Well, uh, emails <clears throat> that I've filed to bring up at just such an occasion. Oh boy. We've been going on about the pizza thing and the hot dog thing, and we haven't done tacos yet, but. You talked about the reason why that your New York pizza is so glorious up there and hallelujah and the sun shines when you take a bite on your fucking head and you get the fucking halo. It's the best. Because of the water, you said, because the New York water makes the pizza and the bagels just so scrumptilious. Well, let me just specify here. That is one of the many reasons why it's the best up here. It's contributory. Yes, because also we have authentic pizza makers up here. People who know what they're doing. People aren't sitting in a fucking Papa John's making a hey, pizza like a jigsaw puzzle. Louisville, Kentucky is the corporate headquarters of Papa John's pizza. I'll have you know, because that Republican son of a bitch is from here and, uh, and it's, it's shitty pizza. I'm not talking about that. You, you, you can't put emo's pizza from St. Louis or the rock bar that we talked about from Evansville, Indiana, or even a good, Joe's special from hometown pizza or a mighty meaty wick from right here in Louisville, Kentucky, the local chains that still care about the community instead of these big corporate conglomerates. I'd put, but, G- I'd put Gino's of Long Beach, New York against any of them. Oh, and, and fuck Gino. I, I didn't, I, like, I'd be I very careful like with he, that. I'd be I didn't <laughs> like him when he worked as the purple bomber. <laughs> and <I'm, laughs> Not that Gino. <laughs> well, There'd be no I'd more pizza there. left if it was that Gino. That may be true, um, but look here. I have received communication from people who are expert in this type of thing, and I would, I'd like to submit this for evidence here on the program. I got an, a, a letter from Dr. Chris Coolmey from San Diego, California. I know him. He's ridden into the drive through before, sure. <clears throat> well, there you go. He says, hello, Jim. I am an entrepreneur who has a water filtration business. The one thing I can say for sure is that all water is ca- contaminated today. Less Crater Lake in Oregon, which is a collapsed volcano without any inlet or outlet, and perhaps a small number of other places I'm missing. Part of the reason for this is water is a container for anything. Water has the space to take on anything it comes into contact with. Our air is filled with contaminants, which then turns into vapor, which turns into water with contaminants. Water may be filtered through soil and rock, but also be contaminated with algae and mold. The rock also may infuse the water with hard minerals, which causes scaling. City water is polluted with waste and medical waste released in urine. New York would need to have a pristine filtration system to account for all of this. Where I find some flaw in the argument over New York water is over conventional water treatment. Any municipality, that treats water will always do so with fluoride and chlorine. Also, if New York had a filtration system, there is no way it could filter out the garbage and leave in the minerals that their water is supposedly famous for. And even then, it would need to change those filters on a regular basis as they lose effectiveness as they are being used. All in all, there is no way New York water is as good as everyone says it is. It is just a myth. From a doctor. What's he a doctor in? He didn't say. 
He's a doctor. I heard a, I heard the word if don't, a lot don't, in that letter. If if this if they really have the war. Listen, you it, conv- no no it, the the declarative statement at the end was all in all there is no way New York water is as good as everyone says it is. It is just a myth. That's what the declarative statement at summation at the end of this piece is. You are conveniently ignoring the many many tweets that we have received, and I know that you have been on them as well. From people saying, of course, Brian's right. The water comes from the Catskills, one of the most beautiful areas of the country. Why do I want water that cats have been killed in? The Catskill Mountains. Oh. The Jewish Riviera at one point. <laughs> Jackie, Jackie Mason was big back in those days at the supper clubs. All right, well, I've got one more uh, uh, testimonial. One more piece of expert witnessing here on... On water and specifically New York water. Hold hold on one second here. Let me find this. I wouldn't necessarily say for sure that that first one was an expert analysis of any of this. There was there was no firm statement of fact in there. The the person is a doctor. In what? In something. You know, Tom Pritchard is a doctor. A, Tom doesn't have papers. He's not legally so allowed. That. He's not <laughs> legally allowed to receive mail. In, in in that time. Anyway, let me well, what... Thompson was a doctor. Timothy Leary, well, a doctor. Well, Dr. Timothy Leary, yes. Well, he went through some type of training. Anyway, I've got one more email that's going to bring this to a close, I think, because this is obviously expert testimony. And just like the doctor's email, there may be some technical verbiage here or some you know, some uh, long phrases used, you know, but uh, unfortunately, another expert weighing in. Judith says New York's water is the same as most large cities. Gray water, look it up. Gray water is shower water, toilet water, dish water. It is that water that goes down the drain. It then goes to filtration equipment where it is extremely filtered and heavily, heavily chemically treated. Then it comes back into your tap again. Yes, your neighbor's shitty toilet water, your uncle's shower drain water, and the grandma the water grandma used to wash her litter box is what you drink. It's what's in the pizza. It is gray water, far more common than we would like to admit in big cities as well as some smaller areas. So yeah, Uncle Frank's shit becomes the pizza water. I live on the shore of Lake Superior in Michigan. Oh, give me a- for all of you Native Americans and also fans of the Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot, of course, that is also AKA Lake Gitchy Gumi. Uh, Superior, they said, never gives up its dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. But anyway, I live on the shore of Lake Superior in Michigan, largest freshwater lake in the country and second in the world. Our water isn't yesterday's piss or last week's burrito bomb. Brian, you don't have the slightest clue of good water. We have good water. Places like Montana have good water. You have Cousin Phil's hangover discharge. They deposited in a throne last week. Another commentary, another opinion without any actual facts, without any tangible evidence to back up the ignorance that is disseminated from that email. Let me read something to you. I think the tangible evidence was from Uncle Phil's burrito bomb last week. I don't that know who Uncle tangible. Phil is. I don't know who Uncle Phil is, but ninety percent. Don't let him around your kids. Then ninety percent of New York City's water supply comes from the Catskill, Delaware watershed, about one hundred and twenty-five miles. Well, about one hundred and twenty-five miles north of the city. They you, keep all the water in a big wooden shed? The watershed sits on over a million acres, both publicly and privately owned. But Wait highly- a minute. That's a, that's a big-ass shed to build. A million acres? How'd they roof it? But highly regulated to make sure contaminants stay out of the water. That's it? I, I can keep going. I thought that was uh, yeah. the exclamation point at the end there. <laughs> if you believe... If you believe in any way, shape, or form of the water that, it, 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 I don't maybe out there in, in your part of New Jersey where the polo ponies roam free, that it's clean. But if you think the people in New York City are, are drinking anything other than fucking a mixture of cow piss and battery acid, you are just, 
you're as crazy as a rainbow trout in a car wash. Then why is there a growing business of water filtration systems that mimic New York City water? What? They're, 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 that is a legitimate business. You go to Florida. Is this something you saw on Shark Tank? No, what it's something the- I actually saw in person in South Florida. Larry King, who's a jerk off, he owns a couple of places where they have New York style food and they have New York water filtration systems to mimic that style of water because the water is so disgusting. In oh, South for Florida. God's sake. You know what they got? They got in the back room, they got an old rabbi taking a piss in a fucking bottle. Here's your New York water. They have giant pictures of Larry King on the wall. Disturbing. Maybe it's possibly it's Larry King. Maybe that's it. He's probably catheterized anyway at this point. <laughs> They're just draining it right in. It's Larry King's special sauce. All right. Well, if you folks, how's this for a segue coming up? <laughs> if you've been disturbed by anything that we have just said and you feel it, you might need to talk to somebody about it because you have in some way complicitly agreed with the horrible and egregiously nasty offensive things that we have just said, or in all seriousness, because this is a serious topic, if you just need to talk to somebody, we've been mentioning on the program uh, for the uh, past several weeks now a company called BetterHelp. It's H-E-L-P, BetterHelp. And how it's it's basically an online and telephonic counseling system where you get access to uh, licensed therapist, professional therapist, 24 hours a day, I believe, right? At, at, or you can schedule it. You can log in at times that are convenient to you. And it's somebody that you can talk to if you don't have access to traditional counseling, or you don't live in a big city, or it's not somebody that you have access to or just feel good about going to. And we've had a bunch of the folks uh, that listened have already said that they were either already using better help or got turned on to it because we talked about it. And it was helping them and what they needed. So uh, another thing that we have brought to the listeners that maybe helps them out. I hear you typing. Are you looking up our preview? Are you still trying to defend New York water while I'm doing the plug? I'm not. I thought I was on mute. You're, I you're looking <laughs> shit up. No, you're, you're looking shit up trying to hit me with while I'm doing this plug. I know. Just in that, for that. You had the actual uh, online conference thing with BetterHelp, and you were even more impressed than I was. So you can fill in the blanks. They seem quite committed to helping people. It's really a very good service. And I just thought, you know, we've talked about it before. We've heard from so many people, so many listeners, whether they are military, active military or ex-military or just people going through hard times. And there are a lot of people out there who don't have someone to talk to. A lot of people out there have a relationship with this show because... For a period of time, this show may be their only source of communication with the outside world. I know that sounds kind of crazy. Not only that, but also dangerous with with some of the ideas that we put in people's minds. But go ahead. But what BetterHelp does is it gives you a chance to speak to someone who can actually help you. Someone who can actually sit down and work with you and talk with you and try to help you get through your rough time. I actually think it's a fantastic service. And we have, uh, as I mentioned, we've read a couple of emails and we will, I don't want to overdo it, but as some of those come in, we'll do it in the future. In the meantime, uh, you can get 10% off of your first month at betterhelp.com slash JCE. That's for the Jim Cornette Experience listeners, betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash JCE. And there's 700,000 people at last count are taking care, charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional at BetterHelp. And then, and also, uh, if you have been traumatized by some of the descriptions that we have talked about here on the program of New York City water, and don't even, don't even try to defend that stuff now anymore here on the program. I think you've been thoroughly debunked. No, I haven't. I'll tell you, a piece of news, I don't know if you've heard about this. Have you heard about this? Have you read about this? David Lagana leaving the NWA. Are you serious? No, I have not heard. Yes, that. because he's now running NBC News, from what I've heard. What? Apparently, David Lagana is running N- N- NBC News because they ran Chris Matthews off. <laughs> I wondered where you were going. With yeah, this. see? <laughs> now it all becomes clear, Grasshopper. Uh, no, these fucking pricks, Chris Matthews. This fucking loudmouth guy from Pennsylvania that, 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 you know, interrogates everybody on the show and is obviously a good, gregarious fellow. 
uh, that, you know, is, is obviously on the right side of everybody, not of everybody, but the right side of politics. And it, it, what the fuck? Because he offended, hurt some woman's feelings that was a guest on the show two years ago is what I heard. And she made comment of it and everybody got mad at him and, 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 and boom, then he's Lagana. Whether he, whether he said, fuck you or whether he fucking was made to retire or whatever the fuck, it's not like he was going to do it that fucking day. And I was, I was for, watching live for, when it happened. Were for you giving the, no, I didn't hear about it because I had a busy week. I didn't hear about it for like three days. That's why I'm saying it now. What the fuck? He gave some woman a compliment. Oh, you're beautiful. When she was getting makeup. Oh, I'd fall in love with you. Or what? He's a nice old fucking man. See, this is the problem. I mentioned the fucking Democrats have idiots too. They're just, they're, they're less harmful in a violent way, but they're still fucking stupid. And there's, there's a, a, a goddamn self-admitted pussy grabber in the White House, and they're running Chris Matthews off because he told some fucking stray woman guest that she was beautiful. If I tell somebody they're beautiful or good-looking or whatever, not, the, uh, wow, what a great set of tits you got, lady, but no, oh, but in a legitimate, non-profane way, and they get offended and pissed off, my next comment would be, well, how about blowing me then? Because fuck you. You know, what the fuck? It, so uh, Chris Matthews can't be on TV anymore, but Donald Trump is still president because all the Democrat idiots get people canceled for fucking giving people a fucking comment and hurting their feelings. And all the Republicans are willing to let anybody, including fucking Hitler and Charles Manson, sit there as long as they get their way. So you got crackpots on both sides. Theirs are more dangerous, but ours are just more annoying because they're such whiny little bitches. You liked Chris Matthews. I did. I like his books, and I enjoyed his show. I didn't always agree with him, but I can watch someone and not always agree with him. <sighs> I think part of the issue, too, it's beyond just the issue with this former um, talking head on the show. It was like within a couple of weeks, he pissed off the Elizabeth Warren supporters he pissed off the Bernie supporters. Well, but, 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 but what, what did he do to piss them off? This is the question, because apparently we've come to find out people get pissed off over anything. Was it a legitimate piss off? I don't think so. Was it a legitimate piss off for the Bernie people? No, nothing's a legitimate piss off for the Bernie people. <laughs> well, then, in that case, then <laughs> fuck all y'all. I mean, that's not hard to fucking say, fuck all y'all. Oh, my God. Anyway, I'll tell you one thing. If you, ladies and gentlemen out there in the cult of Cornette, if you are a former network news anchor, even a local news anchor, who has been kicked off the air because you told somebody that they looked good, you may be entitled to compensation. Chris Matthews, you may be entitled to compensation. I know somebody that would take on even the heads, the heads of power, at 30 Rock itself, NBC News, NBC Broadcasting, the headquarters. I know somebody that would lay waste to the NBC legal staff. I know somebody that would march through NBC like Sherman through Georgia and leave no stone unturned to make Chris Matthews the wealthiest man in the history of television broadcasting. I know who that man is. Do you? Call Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two, still to the rest. Brian, say something good about Stephen for a minute. I'm still blowed up from that fucking intro. What a fantastic guy Stephen Pinu is. And he will kick ass on your behalf every single time in the courtroom. He is an assassin. He destroys the major corporations that he goes up against. He'll destroy the He breaks dwellers. them to their knees. Well, you said it. The, the basement dwellers are already lower than their knees. So he's... 
he he puts them down even further. It's it's journey to the center of the earth for the basement dwellers against Stephen P. New. By the way, that number is 888-692-8084. And the email is newlawoffice.com. And I'm still out of breath, but only because my heart palpitates at the thought of how that he can get you compensated for the big corporations and the major conglomerates and the big wigs that have tried to put you under their thumb and have have damaged or harmed or impaired you or your family or your friends, including, by the way, I still may have Stephen investigate this uh, Zantac thing for me. You never know. Now Zantac, they say, was causing cancer. I've had a lot of heartburn. I've not got any news yet, but by God, I know who I'm going to call. And actually, some of the cult members have gotten uh, their family members hooked up with Stephen because of this Zantac issue. You don't know what to trust anymore. That's why it's good to have Steven's number on speed dial. Fuck better call Saul. He hangs out with some shady characters anyway. And you don't want to have to go all the way out in the desert to find an attorney that'll fight for your rights. Steven's right in the mountains of West Virginia where people belong. So anyway, the law office of Stephen P. New, Stephen P. New is for you. Get even with Stephen, 888-692-8084. Have I made this abundantly clear? At this point, Brian, you certainly have. And I've done a little research here and I have some information about what Chris Matthews did to piss off the Bernie Sanders supporters. All right. This is from the New York Times. Mr. Matthews, who has a reputation for pugnacious commentary, drew fire from Sanders aides and at least one network colleague after he compared his victory in the Nevada caucuses to the Nazi takeover of France in World War II. <laughs> Wait, I, I didn't know about this. I, I'm not. I'm not seeing the comparison. Uh, actually, are you, or am I missing something? Is here's the quote: "The general calls up Churchill and says it's over." Mr. Matthews said during a Saturday broadcast as he tried to describe Democrats' surprise at Mr. <laughs> Sanders' com- command. <laughs> And Mr. Sanders' <laughs> command, excuse me, of the party primary. Churchill says, how could it be? You've got the greatest army in Europe. How could it be over? He said, it's over. <laughs> so it was because it was a shock, not because they acted like Nazis. It Because it was a huge shock is where he was going with this, apparently. Mr. Sanders' communications director, Mike Saska, uh, C-A-S-C-A, I guess that's how you would pronounce that. His quote, Never thought part of my job would be pleading with the national news network to stop likening the campaign of a Jewish presidential candidate <laughs> whose family was wiped out by the Nazis <laughs> to the Third Reich. <laughs> oh my God. Well, maybe Chris needed a vacation. <laughs> well, fuck, he's 75 years old. It's not like if he takes a vacation, that could that's like, you know, saving up your fucking vacation time when you want to leave your job and taking it all at the end. He may not have time to come back anyway. And he issued an apology after the fact. Well, yeah, he's a very nice man. You can tell that. Everybody that was working with him liked him. Some twat has to get her bustle in a fucking uproar. Anyway, speaking of uproars, my boy, my illegitimate son, I've, you know, 23 years ago, I, the WWF, I was just starting to go back to the Northeast again. Did you see last week MJF fingered some kid? Well, <laughs> let's not put it that way. No, he gave him the finger right on camera. He stuck that finger right out in his face. He gave a kid the middle finger. That's yes. Not, yes. I'm, yes. Well, what did I say? You said MJF fingered a kid. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends on how you want to look at it. Um, but every it got covered by TMZ. What the fuck have we come to where a heel being a fucking heel wrestler gets covered by TMZ just because they're being a heel? They'll cover anything. They cover a rapper getting off a plane. <laughs> <laughs> but do they cover the same one getting on again? That's the question. Is he as important when he leaves town as he was when he came in? But anyway, at, at an autograph session, and somebody wrote and, and asked on Twitter, said, well, why do they have heels doing appearances and autograph sessions anyway? And my answer is, I have no fucking idea. With MJF, you can do it, and that's exactly why, because he can be a smartass. He's so quick, and he's real. He can be a smartass to anybody at any time, but a monster heel or a fucking... 
a different type of heel. You just, you don't want them to interact with people and because they can't, you know, actually slap them around or they're probably encouraged not to or bite their heads off verbally or whatever, or just be pricks all day. But MJF people get entertainment out of it because he is such a fucking smarmy prick. And as long as he's being a smarmy prick to somebody else, you think it's funny until he does it to you or your fucking kid. And so they're doing the photo and he gives the kid the finger. He's like seven. And the father just doesn't even say, he, I don't even think he saw it at the time. And they take the picture. And then after, I guess the dad went to Cody and was like, complained, like, why would he do that? And Cody said, why would you think that our talent would act any different off camera or off television than they do on, but here's a bunch of free tickets. Uh, but so MJF gets, I mean, he's a genius. He's better than Sputnik Monroe at getting in the papers. Sputnik Monroe had to go to the mid South fair and get knocked out by a cowboy and land in cow shit. All MJF had to do was flip off a seven year old. He's a genius. And, and, and I don't know. Come to think of it. I don't think that I ever saw a heel do a personal appearance until 1989 when, Crockett took over the fucking, or not Crockett took over, when uh, uh, Turner took over from Crockett is what I'm trying to say. And then they just booked guys willy nilly because they were names. And the heels had to go sit there and kind of be frumpy. Did you see Cody's response? Yes, I just mentioned it. When he said, don't, don't think that the fucking, were you not listening to me again? I was actually looking up his response when you were saying it. Yeah, when I was saying his response. Oh, no. You're actually, you're filling out your fucking employment resume to try to hire on at another fucking, you think I'm fucking cracking up, don't you? You're hiring on at another show. It's late. It is late. It, it's, it's late. It's late. All right, let's get anyway. So MJF fingered a kid and I'm happy about it. There's a good quote for Twitter. Can you imagine all the people that will go insane if you just tweet, quote, Cornette said MJF fingered a kid and I'm happy about it. Oh, God. I got an email real quick before we do these show reviews. You think, can I, can you, can you be up a little while longer? I think so. All right. Uh, we talked about Ole Anderson a bunch here recently. And I actually heard, I'm not going to read the whole, I'm not going to read quote for quote because it's a personal letter amongst old friends. But I heard from Bryant Anderson, Ole's son, that briefly wrestled for us in Smoky Mountain Wrestling that we were doing the promos in uh, introducing Bryant to Smoky Mountain Wrestling out in the parking lot of the power plant when Bischoff came and fucking got stern with Ole. And Ole was like, well, come on, Eric. You're going to fire me? And he didn't. He left and then fired him on the phone the next day. But anyway, um, Bryant's heard some of the shows here recently. I hadn't heard from him in ages, didn't know what he was doing these days. Apparently, it's all Bryant was one of those guys where if there had been territories and places to learn already with just being a rookie, was you could tell could be a good professional wrestler, maybe a very good professional wrestler. He just trained at the power plant. You didn't get a ton of personal instruction there. I mean, you know, Ole had obviously uh, worked with him, but really Smoky Mountain Wrestling was the only place he worked in front of people presented as someone. And Tracy Smothers helped him out quite a bit, but he was a big kid. He, he was a good amateur. He had the fucking capabilities, and he was intelligent and knew how to talk like his old man. But uh, since there were no more territories, and to be honest, as you will see, uh, he had other avenues to explore. He decided to drop out of the business. He's an attorney now. Can you imagine being defended in court? By, by, if, if Bryant channeled that interview from Atlanta TV, I, and then I asked for a continuance, Judd, and the idiot went for it. Um, but it, I thought that would get a pop out of you. I think he's gone to sleep, ladies and gentlemen, Brian. Anyway, uh, Bryant is an attorney now, but he wrote me, just let me know that he was amused at the program because he said some of my views about the wrestling business remind him of his old man. Uh, it, it, both of us have a disdain for people who want to make the business a ridiculous bunch of ha-ha, he says. But then he's scared to tell his dad that Cornette reminds me of you, dad, because then he's afraid his dad will get mad that his son is reminded of him by the fat manager. <laughs> so anyway, 
but yes, but uh, uh, Bryant is now an attorney, and as a matter of fact, he said uh, some of the the stuff that we taught him in Smoky Mountain, and and one time he mentioned specifically in Johnson City at Freedom Hall when I talked to him about the way he was pacing his stuff, he uses it as his public speaking, and he got the best grade in his mock trial class by using Southern wrestling promo lessons. So anyway, I'm glad Brian's doing good. And I'm glad that he thinks that he... Now, see, 25 years ago, I'd like, somebody thinks you remind me of Oli, fuck you. Now I'm like, that's a compliment. Does he still have the facial hair? He might have had to tone that down. I don't know. He might look like William Jennings <laughs> Bryan. That's the last time that was in fashion. Anyway, what are you doing on your shows? And let's talk about what they're doing on these shows. Another packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. All shows available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Get more information on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Now you're typing behind me. No, I'm I'm shuffling papers around to get my notes ready while you're droning on. This week on Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry. I got to answer that. I need to keep that. Okay, go ahead. The boys review the January 4th, 1994 match in Pikeville, Kentucky. The Rock and Roll Express versus the Heavenly Bodies. Any memories of that match, Jim? Which which date was it? What uh... January 4th, 94. We weren't in Pikeville on January 4th of 1994, were we? Uh, unless Jeff wrote the wrong date to me. <laughs> what, what happened in the match? <laughs> I guess it wouldn't have been. When was the famous final scene? The Bluegrass Brawl, that was April. That was April. April 1994. The, the, the biggest pop ever for a fucking finish in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. It, 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 it popped him so bad he fucking got dizzy and went three months back in time. We'll hear more of this historical accuracy. I'm breaking <laughs> case with Baldrin and Barry. They're, they're only off by about three months or so either way, folks. At BaldrinPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast this week on the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast with Mike Sempervivi and Roman Gomez, who will be in Circleville, by the way. He's very much looking forward to meeting you. The boys look at Mid-Atlantic Television from March 6, 1982. Hear all about what's happening with Roddy Piper, the Briscoes, Sergeant Slaughter and his privates, Austin <laughs> Idol, Jimmy Valiant, and so much more. <laughs> MidAtlanticPod.com. There is that one interview. I forget which one it was where he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to my privates. <laughs> <laughs> and Kernodo and Nelson are standing there. <sighs> and of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Oh, fuck. I, oh, you've taken it easy for the past few weeks. I've forgotten how painful that can be. The Pampero Furpo special this weekend. It should be out Sunday. So get ready for this. Historical audio as well as an exclusive interview with Pampero Furpo's daughter, Mary, and several historians chiming in on their memories of Pampero Furpo. We have audio of his debut in New York. And we also have audio from Hawaii. You're going to want to check this out. Another great history lesson from the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. Yeah, Mother Something. All right. Um, we've had the big experiment now. This is the third week that we've watched Raw and talked about Raw, right? Third and final week, I think we've agreed on. Um, they did go out with a bang, at least on this one, compared to... I get when you know when you've been on Devil's Island and you're used to eating slop with maggots in it, and suddenly you get a gas station hot dog. It looks like a gourmet meal, right? So maybe there might be an element of that in here. But at least they did some things that didn't make me want to tear what's left of my hair out of my head. Um, I mean, it would have, what did you think overall compared to the previous two weeks' programs of this telecast? Well, it was worlds better than the episode two weeks back, which was the, one of the worst episodes of any wrestling show I've ever seen. It was, I, I guess you could say it was better than last week's show. Look, the issue, it's hard for me to like it at all. It just, it goes on forever. I couldn't <laughs> watch it in one sitting. AEW, I could sit down and watch and get through. And even though there's stuff I don't like, and there's a lot of stuff I like, it kind of flies by. Raw just takes forever. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say flies, but yes, it's and of course it is two hours versus three. But yes, AEW, we're going to talk about that. But AEW moves, and uh, 
it, it just it has more pace to it than this thing that is just milked to death. But having said that, with the first segment being Heyman and Brock and the thing with Drew McIntyre, did you notice this was the best first segment out of the three weeks, and this was also the shortest? And and people say, you know, we're as well, Heyman's in charge of Raw. I don't know if Heyman's in charge of all of Raw, but Heyman was in charge of this. It's like they asked, okay, how in 15 minutes can you go out and get Drew McIntyre over as much as humanly possible? Okay. Um, it, it, he, his promo, he tells the story. First of all, have you ever thought that you would ever see the same human being 30 years ago? He looked like Michael Keaton, and now he looks like Alfred Hitchcock. I'm afraid in 10 more years, he's going to look like Tor Johnson. <laughs> um, but from the time he says, good evening, he he cuts a promo. He tells a story. He keeps you uh, keeps your attention. It's not droning. He's not lost. I never mind hearing Paul E. because he says something, and just the inflection. And he half ass sounds like he means it. Unlike almost everybody else on the, on the program. But he built up McIntyre, and then boom, here he comes, and Brock backs off. And then suddenly charges and gets hit with the big kick and then, boom, bails out. And I was almost like, well, that was a little fucking flat, right? But they milked it. Um, well, he was, you know, out cold and then Drew left, right? And then Brock just leaves. And I'm like, well, fuck. But when McIntyre came back out and hit him with the kick on the stage and then held up the belt, okay, yeah, and then that tells me that's an old ECW thing. Everything happens in threes anyway, right? But there had to be the third one and gets the people to chant holy shit. So it was kind of flat at first, and within two or three minutes after that, he had them chanting holy shit. And the whole thing came in under 15 minutes. Do you, what more could they have done with Drew McIntyre but had him rescue a baby from a burning building? I thought it was really good. I thought it was really effective. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago. Brock Lesnar is this great, believable badass, and he also sells better than anyone in the business. Yeah, because like, he sells different. It's believable. It, it, he sells yeah. like you, you really think he may be hurt. Yeah, because he just throws himself into shit, figuring, I guess, that he won't hurt himself too bad. Uh, but but yeah, that so that opening segment... I think is the only one that actually made me want to see more of those people that they've done in three weeks. But then, God damn it. The next match was the Street Profits against Seth Rollins and Murphy, Murph the Surf, our little buddy Murphy. And it's almost like Seth is surrounded. He is a, a nice red rose surrounded by weeds to where that he's starting to wilt himself. I thought in this match, it was just, he was kind of one of the guys. It, it, it's a, a scripted promo routine by the street profits in the ring by themselves. And then the, they allegedly are going to have a match. But as soon as they go into a hundred mile an hour, jump start and do a big dive, they go to the break. So once again, they've minimized the matches so much to that's where you could actually get programming that people will pay attention to for five or seven or eight or 10 minutes of a segment instead of people droning on talking saying can fucking scripted bullshit endlessly but the the match every time a match breaks out they go to commercial and they come back on the other side in a stationary chin lock i wrote why do i care when they go to break as soon as the match starts and come back to boring it, it <clears throat> And then, you know, immediately uh, Dawkins, is that his name? Dawkins? Yes. I can't read my yes. own writing. Yes. He immediately beats up both heels on the floor. <clears throat> and th th I've, I've watched this. He is, Somehow or another, he did the dive out on the floor. He knocked him down on the floor, whatever. He crawls into an empty ring. He's crawling across about halfway across the ring. Do you remember this part? There's no heel. They're both on the floor outside. There's nobody in the ring. He gets up and dives and makes the alleged hot tag. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No human could have. There was nobody around. It, it was. And everybody could see there was no way he could be stopped. And then the fucking, so Ford gets the hot tag and he does another dive out there and splatters everybody and he beats up both heels. And Montez Ford shit is great. 
it's athletic as hell and and he does very precise great precision looks like he's doing it safe but these matches just they're either all in break or they don't make any sense they did a bunch of double teams and false finishes back and forth and then Ford rolled out of their double team. They were going to do the the deal where Rollins go, gives him the buckle bomb and Murphy runs up and carries him in the back of the head, right? Ford rolls out of it and propels Seth into the corner and Murphy kicks Seth. That would be a great finish if to, for them to fuck themselves and, and the baby faces win, right? But here is just another fucking spot. And then Ford foils the heels, but... <sighs> Seth threw him off the top rope to the floor, which once again, <laughs> it was another, you know, chance at a hospitalization angle. He just flung him off the top rope down to the floor and the AOP come down specifically to get kicked out so they can distract the referee. So Kevin Owens runs in and stunners Rollins. And then everybody runs after him or out away from him, and Ford hits a splash on Seth off the top that was beautiful. One, two, three. My summation of this, whatever the fuck this was, to quote the incredible character actor of the 60s and 70s, Billy DeWolf, busy, busy, busy. People just running it back and forth and doing shit. There was no story to this no we we missed the first three minutes of it <laughs> what we did see was was just back and forth gaga a couple of different things that could have been the finish and a guy runs in because something he did last week nobody got over if they're gonna put the belts on these guys just put the belts on them my god the the finish could have been when the fucking heels did their spot in the corner where they foiled themselves and the baby face would have got a huge pop without all this busyness that was, was it meant to protect people or continue Kevin Owens, thing with Seth. So it's more important in that instance to continue Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins heat than to get the new baby face tag team champions over. I don't know what the fuck they were doing. It's a little pitchy for me, dog. I thought I wasn't uh, as negative on their promo before the match as you, because I thought there were so many other really awful scripted <laughs> promos throughout this show and in the last several weeks. I thought at least they seemed like they had some emotion to them and the fans were into them. I think Ford is pretty spectacular. I mean, yeah. the height he gets on like that frog splash is incredible. He's like their version of uh, I, uh, Mark Quinn. I think he's more impressive than Mark Quinn from what well, I've he, seen so far. He's more, he's more polished because he's had better training in the basics. He's more precise. He's safer looking. Uh, Quinn may have him beat on some fucking athletic shit, but Quinn's smaller also. But anyway, yes. You know, and uh, I guess we'll talk about this here. I have a lot of friends who have worked in radio, including uh, very, very high executive positions. And Well, they're, they're, their drug habits are none of your business, and those things have been cleared up long ago very high friends mel carmazan made a lot of money for the companies he worked for by throwing as many commercials as possible into the radio stations that were under his control and what it also did was turn people away from listening to radio and i'm using that as a comparison to this because i said the show goes on forever and it does but whenever there's a chance of getting into something yeah. They go to a commercial break and then they come back from the commercial break and they go to the picture in picture. It's nonstop. You can't get into anything. It's not conducive to making someone sit there and watch the show and get into a match. You can't get into any matches. It's just, it's like segments of matches thrown together. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it... What came next? Uh, the 24 7 title, Ricochet and Riddick Moss. I've not seen Riddick Moss. Uh, and I hope to fuck that the airline lost his bag, is why he was wrestling in tennis shoes. That's the only acceptable explanation. Otherwise, somebody needs to yank a knot in his tail. Um, but he's green, but he looks great. 
Apparently they want to make some somebody out of him. Ricochet is another guy. He's very he's incredibly fast. He was hitting the ropes. He looked faster than Sayama in some of this stuff. And he's very precise. It, it, we've just talked about it before. He's just it, one thing is I I don't see a lot of fire, personality, passion shit from him. But secondly, so many more people are doing the shit he's doing. It's not like when fucking Rey Mysterio came along and was doing shit at a much higher level and unlike anybody else. So we're, we're going for we're a lot of gymnastics, but anyway, the point is they go for less than two minutes and take a big bump and go to the break. Yep. So then when we come back, Ricochet is doing a nice comeback. He, he did something. Tom Pritchard would have yanked him. I guess because people were, you know, not reacting to his liking, but he pops up and he does the baby face thing where he looks at the people and says, come on, no, fuck you, is what Tom would respond in wrestling school. You don't look at the people and tell them to come on. That's fucking bullshit baby face stuff. You fucking look at your opponent and fire up and maybe you tell him to get up and you're making that motion and that indirectly brings people into it if they give a fuck about you but you never tell the people to come on because they can just as easily say no fuck you make me that's what the young bucks do every match well that's because they never went to proper wrestling school but anyway uh but so he did a nice comeback ricochet did and kept it moving but then here comes moss he hits two big moves boom one two three is this not the guy was he not Challenging for the world title and and figured in, does he have some heat? Two weeks ago, he was a fucking big star, right? What happened? I don't know. I was surprised by the finish. And uh, yeah, he was against Lesnar in Saudi Arabia. He owes somebody some trans, apparently. Yeah, so I was surprised by that as well. Yes. I, I wrote down here, wow. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, it's late. Uh, the next thing, they showed a VTR of AJ Styles getting beat by The Undertaker with one fucking choke slam in 10 seconds at the Super Show. Day. So this is, is... And then AJ comes out and does the promo, and he's pissed off about it, obviously. It's... AJ has come a long way since those TNA promos. And, he, you know, he is more well-spoken and more natural and etc. But... A, 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 this was, I think, overly, you know, written for him, but also ha- he's one of the top guys in the company. Why do a one choke slam fucking match? Why not do something else with AJ? Because he's talking about a, a rematch. I don't see how that might be a fucking box office attraction at this point. What's well, a way of getting the Undertaker on Mania against one of the top workers who can maybe do a little bit more in the ring than some of the recent opponents he's had? Well, but then they should have done it in reverse. They should have had a halfway decent fucking package match where you could make a package out of it in Saudi Arabia and then do the choke slam at WrestleMania. Because they always need to save time at WrestleMania and it would make more sense at the. I don't know, fucking no. <laughs> but then, it, it, if this is supposed to help AJ. AJ Styles is supposed to rest, wrestle Alistair Black. But AJ then quotes a contract that Alistair Black signed that we haven't seen. He didn't have a copy of. There's no authority figure or commissioner there to say, well, yeah, that's what it says. They just make this up as they go along in the ring. And the referees let him. And he says, first, you got to beat Carl Anderson. So then immediately the match becomes... Alistair Black and Carl Anderson and Alistair Black bumps Anderson and Gallows and they go to break right as the action breaks out. What did they say? And when they come back, guess what to come back to, Brian? Nothing happening. A chin lock. They left with everybody standing still and they come back with everybody standing still. And then Alistair Black makes a quick comeback, hits his kick once, the one that last week, uh, what's his name, Harper, took two of them. No, Rowan. Rowan. Harper was the other guy. Rowan took two of them, but this will hit kick once, boom, down goes Anderson. Now he gets AJ. But no, AJ gets on a microphone. Well, that contract, you also got to go through Gallows. 
what the fuck? This is starting to get <clears throat> the way they're presenting it. It's getting bad heat. It's bait and switch. It's the heel is just making this up rather than he has proven this and an authority figure has blessed it as being something that has to happen. It's just being made up as they go along. And it's, that's not even good heat anymore. Cause now people are starting oh, what the fuck? And then gallows jumps him. They trade big kicks. Gallows gets some heat on him primarily with a chin lock. I like Luke gallows, but of course he's saving him. Cause Alistair blacks out here going fucking 30 minutes or whatever. But then they go to break. And when they come back, it gallows it basically beats up Black in the corner and gets disqualified. And then Gallows and Anderson get more heat on Alistair Black. And then they give Alistair Black a big double team move. And then AJ steps in. And Alistair Black sells to his feet. AJ starts beating him up, and then Alistair Black starts fucking making a comeback, fighting back. And AJ finally just springboards, hits his forearm, one, two, three. That did nobody any good and was basically just to fill 30 minutes of fucking TV time. I don't know. Did you see any point to all of this? This dragged on so long. I hated it. The commercial breaks killed any momentum any of this had. And I didn't even think about AJ as much as Alistair Black because he's young and He's got potential and he has a good look. You know, if you're into that tattooed look. But I couldn't see how this helped him in any way. You could say, oh, well, he couldn't beat AJ because he had to go through the other guys. But he didn't come out of this. It didn't benefit him at all, this whole well, series of matches. Also, wasn't the last time they wanted to beat one of the heels, didn't they beat Anderson? Is he like, because he's, he's not AJ, but he's a smaller one between him and Gallows. That they poor got to beat poor Anderson all the time. What the, I just, I don't know, but once again, it just, it was more like they just had to keep doing stuff rather than any of the stuff they were doing was that important to the overall point of the thing. Um, Liv Morgan versus Ruby Riot. Guess what happened? I fast forwarded this fucking thing because I was getting tired, but they did a fast count with referee Sarah Logan, who also is in the match uh, that they're plugging the Elimination Chamber match or whatever. So who could have ever thought that she would have got involved? It's the first match she's ever refereed on the show, I'm pretty sure. And did they ever say why the fuck, before I fast forwarded, that she was the referee? Otherwise, then they, we need to do an angle? Well, they explained that the three of them were in a faction together, but they didn't explain exactly why she was made the referee that I why for the first time she's going to referee a fucking match let's put it this way if they did explain it it went right over my head because by this point I did not want to watch this show anymore okay they recapped Orton and Edge and then a bunch of people dressed in funny costumes asked Rowan what was in his cage and he pulled out a wind up spider and they all ran away in horror and fear <laughs> a oh. lot of people Said, I can't wait to hear what Jim Cornette thought of this. The big reveal to what Eric Rowan had. Well, in his what game. the fuck? If it was a real spider that fucking big, I'd go, oh shit, I'd go, oh shit, too. I did. The, the first time I met Dixie Carter, I've told the story. This fucking idiot goof guy that used to work for Les Thatcher in the HWA because he had had a brief cruiserweight contract from WCW, and that's where they sent the cruiserweights to train with Cincinnati. And I hadn't seen him in years because he wasn't very good and he was, you know, let go. He's there in TNA what, the, like the second time I'm there. Dixie wasn't even there the first time I was there, I don't believe. Second time I'm there, I'm walking in with some papers, trying to go to the production room or whatever the fuck, and this guy's there. And I, I see him and I say hello and walk up to shake his hand. And he sticks his hand out, and he has in his hand a live, a real spider, as big or big as his entire hand, and it's within two feet of me. And I see that, and I pull back. I'm like, you stupid motherfucker. And he's smiling. I say, you fucking smile. I go get in my fucking truck and run your fucking sorry ass over, you piece of shit. You get that goddamn thing away from me. If I see you again, I will fucking attempt to kill you. And then I fucking storm through the hallway and I see Terry Taylor, who's supposed to be in charge of this goddamn bowl of mixed nuts. <laughs> and I said, Terry, 
<laughs> There's a goddamn job guy from Tennessee or from uh, uh, Ohio out there with a goddamn real spider as big as my fucking head. And if he fucking gets it near me one more time, I'm going to cave his fucking skull in the fucking piece of shit. And he's talking to some woman. He said, Jim, meet Dixie Carter. I said, hello, Dixie. God damn it, Terry. <laughs> so she knew early on. But that made me so fucking mad. What a, but, but this was not a real spider. So what the fuck? It's stupid. Stupid. Anyway, so that's what I think of that. What are the, how can you have grown people being scared of an obviously wind up fake spider? That's the whole point. The whole idea of raw is grown people acting the way no grown ups act. As well, opposed speaking, to wrestling, which is to be adults acting like crazy adults. Yes. Like crazy violent adults act. Speaking of, of people that wouldn't act this way, the Kabuki Warriors did a promo. And then Shayna Baszler wrestled Carrie Sane. And I watched this because of Shayna Baszler. I know Carrie Sane is a better worker than who I'm about to mention, but she is barely bigger than Riho. And it, at least they don't say she turned professional wrestler at the age of nine, but I'm just, uh. but here's the, go back and watch this. If anybody cares enough to, I don't know why you would, but apply this criticism to it early on in the match, especially Shayna Baszler was trying to have Carrie Sane's match rather than Carrie Sane trying to have hers. And that's what should have been done was Carrie Sane having Shayna Baszler's match. Shayna Baszler was out there trying to follow through on some flips and be flung around in a lucha style. No, she doesn't look natural at it. That's not what she should be doing. She's money. Carrie Sane ain't money right now in this environment. I don't see when you've got the Shayna Baszler's and the Rhea Ripley's and the Charlotte's and the fucking major female athletes that, and, and the, uh, the, that are either great workers or have some type of shoot background. <clears throat> and it, that's a lot of times, especially if somebody is putting somebody over the guy or girl that's winning will say, okay, what do you do? I want to do some of your stuff to, you know, so not to bury him, but no, in some cases it needs a, and the producers can't just make this call on their own. They have to take instructions from the writers, but this should have been within Shayna Baszler's match context Carrie Sane being a little quicker and evading some things, getting out of some fucking rides or go-behinds or whatever, or submission efforts or whatever. But it should have, the whole flavor should have been Shayna Baszler's match and Carrie Sane should have been allowed to foil a few things. But also, this one was so fucking long. Yeah. It, 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 it Shayna finally gets some heat on her. I like the joint manipulation. I like her aggressiveness, the attitude. She controlled Carrie Sane well during this heat. And then all of a sudden, Becky Lynch's music plays. And out of nowhere, here comes Becky Lynch down the ramp. And suddenly we go to break. What the fuck? You've just, now we will find out that you've just really fucking jacked me around without even tickling my taint. When we come back, there's been no fight between Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler. There's been no confrontation. Now Becky's on color. The music has died down, and Shayna Baszler is still fucking kicking Carrie Sane's ass. And more of the match. It was it was uh, starting to be long before the break. After the break, this the match in the ring went south. Becky Lynch was great. She's a fucking she's a female Austin with her promo and everything, but. This should have been one segment, and Shayna, they should have brought Becky out earlier to do the color instead of the tease for this. Stay tuned for three minutes just because this girl's walking to the ring. And Shayna Baszler should have got a fucking tap out in fairly decisive fashion, in my opinion. And they could have saved a segment. They could have gave somebody else a nice little win, too, to get them over. Fuck. I, don't, you, I know you like Kyrie Sane. I like Kyrie Sane. I like... Asuka, I, I like the Kabuki Warriors. I get a kick out of them. And I think they're both really good in the ring. But with that said, that was my exact thought, what you just said, which, which was that it should have been quicker. This is Shayna Baszler's first match on Raw. They're building her up for Becky Lynch. She's got a great look. She's believable. She should have squashed her. Should have been two minutes yeah. in and out. 
Look at how impressive she is. What's Becky going to do against her? Sometimes I used to tell guys this all the time. You don't need to have a great match just because you can. Sometimes a great match is not called for, at least not every single time, for the greater good. Anyway, you know, even in, in the, John Wayne, except for the main heel in the movie, John Wayne knocked most of his fucking opponents out with just a punch or two, right? But then the main heel would be allowed to get the heat. But, you know, John's got to fucking get over first. It's it, Anyway, I'm going to piss some people off here, but the next match was Rey Mysterio and Leo Carrillo, whatever his fucking name is. Humberto. Humberto. Against Garza and Andrade, Andrade, uh, what is his fucking name? Andrada, Andra, Andrade, yeah, I think and, so. Andre, Andre the Mexican. I don't fucking know. <laughs> now you got me questioning what it is. I can't even hear it the right way anymore. I'm hearing yeah. you. <laughs> Andrade, well, anyway, I think. All right, point with Selena Vega, who I like. I like her a lot, and this is Rey Mysterio. But I got to be honest, I fast forwarded this match because I don't care about anybody but Rey Mysterio. And this this match went through two breaks, which means three different segments of match broken up. And I zip to the end because to me, I'm seeing middle card fucking talent. I don't care except for Vega and Mysterio. Vega needs to be with a top talent and Rey Mysterio is, you know, a legend. Well, let me just say, I think Garza has a ton of potential and I think Andrade is, that is how you say his name. Uh, I think he's really good. Uh, and he's also Charlotte's fiance, if you didn't know that. But someone told me that, did you work with Garza the last time you were in TNA Impact? Whatever it was at that time. Did you do Pro- something with him? Possibly. Well, you know, come to think of it, yes, probably, I think. I don't fucking know. That was 10 years ago. He would have been very young. I remember a Garza. No, maybe when you went back when Bruce was there and Jeff was Oh, 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 I've, I've tried to put that out of my mind. Well, possibly, as a matter of fact, maybe maybe you're right. And, well, and, and here's the thing. I'm not saying Garza can't be good, but I, the way these guys are presented, I said Carrillo looks like he's fucking 12 facially. He looks like goddamn, you know, fucking Beaver Cleaver. Garza, I don't like the smiling and kidding around and the whipping the pants off and everything, the male stripper thing. I see him if he gets older and rougher looking, he can he's, he can work. And and Andrade, um, I, I I just I don't see them presented as top guys that that has have done anything or said anything that I should care about so far. I'm sorry. But Rey Mysterio made a big comeback, and he is so smooth and spot on. Boom. And then uh, Carrillo hit the splash, one, two, three. And that took a long time also. Uh, You know what? (sighs) Jesus Christ. I waited for the. I especially wanted to see this because I wanted to see the big explanation, right, for why Orton turned on Edge for why he's done all these things he's done that we've been following, right? Caved Matt Hardy's head in twice after turning on his old friend Edge. Broke up the old gang, so to speak. <clears throat> and so Beth Phoenix comes out. Everybody knows she and Edge are married. And it actually, I've, Beth was in OVW, and she is always taking the business seriously. I always liked her. She was always fucking on time and worked hard, et cetera, et cetera. I've always been an Edge fan. I'm happy to see them happy together and living in the mountains of Asheville and with nice children, if that's the kind of thing you like, which apparently they do, so I'm happy for them about it. And they they could make something out of this because Beth isn't just some fucking random wife of a wrestler. She's also been a star wrestler. And she's all she's well-known, and she can work so there's all kinds of things they could do to make this interesting, right? This was not one of them. And I, when Beth came out, Orton interrupts, he comes out. I liked that Orton tried to give her the hug and then offered the handshake or whatever, and that Beth fired up on him and called him a son of a bitch, and Beth was doing a good job with the material that she was presented. And so did Orton, or especially when he got into it in the middle of it, he did a great job delivering the story that he was told to deliver. But this was so Hollywood writerish. 
it was it, it, it was a good long story, but a complete expose. First of all, of the business, uh, me and Edge. One day, kid, we'll work together, not team up together, but we'll work together, and then s steal the show together. He came out and said that, so it's complete expose. Which then the logic becomes, okay. Edge told young Randy Orton when he got into business, maybe that what they one day could have fake matches together with each other and tear the house down and steal the show. But now he really caved his head in because of the fake matches that they used to have. Do you see where I'm going with this? Why is what they're talking about now real when they've just talked about all the fake shit they used to do? Then it became an episode of fucking Leave it to Beaver as he went through all the various personal trials and tribulations, the family life, the kids, and his, you know, the Edge and Beth have the kids and the wife and the dogs and the whole nine yards while he had a fucking bad period and Edge saved his life and Edge was built up to sound like a saint. And then the explanation for why that Randy Orton after having numerous fake matches against this man all across the country. And then this man saved his life for real from all the bad decisions he made. And he's so happy that fucking this man has a happy home life that the reason why that he turned on him and bashed his head in with multiple metal steel chairs was to save his life and keep him away from wrestling so that he wouldn't get hurt again and not be able to enjoy his family life. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like me telling you, Brian, you keep roller skating. I'm afraid you're going to break your ankle. So I'm going to cut both your legs off with a chainsaw. And that way you won't be able to break your ankle. What the fuck did this mean? <laughs> what did this mean? I Help have, me. I have no idea. I mean, if you were coming to me for an answer, I have no idea. It makes no sense. He, honest to God, said that he he didn't want Edge to come back full time and possibly hurt his neck again and not be able to have a good quality of life. So he decided to fucking attack his good friend that saved his life, pummel him into insensibility, and cave his fucking skull in with two metal folding chairs on the off chance that he might get hurt again in wrestling. He's going to make sure he doesn't have that happen to him by fucking crippling him and making him a paraplegic. The fuck? This was the most convoluted, stupid explanation I have ever heard. And I even, I even wrote, Randy Orton is doing a great job with this, but it's caca. And then, while Beth has to stand there and cry on minutes on end while he gets this whole thing out, then he turns around and blamed, actually, it's Beth's fault instead of Edge's fault because Beth is an enabler and she made it possible for him to do the, for, made it possible for Edge to come back. So she made Orton do what he did. He had to do it. This is like fucking Jerry Springer where they started working and they did a few shows and, you know, said, well, fuck, we, we don't really have this down yet. It wasn't even good, Jerry Springer. And then Beth slaps him. Good slap. They stared at each other forever. The fans are now chanting RKO. So now we have built a situation where that the heel has given the baby face a potential career ending injury. His wife has come out to give the people a medical update on the baby face. And now the fans are chanting for the heel to cripple the baby face's wife. And they're chanting RKO. He calls her a bitch under his breath, which was, I'm sure, her cue to kick him in the fucking gonads, where he then flies into an RKO, and boy, she sold this great, because she is a great fucking athlete. And he dropped her, and the people popped like the goddamn free money was being given out in the arena. And then Orton leaves, the announcers sell it like a funeral, and suddenly now, whereas when Orton was killing Edge, it went on for minutes at a time and nobody came out, but now suddenly all the boys in the back that are friends of Edge's come out to 
Maybe they wanted to cop a feel of poor Beth while she was laying there. <laughs> oh, no. But now there's a bunch of the boys out there to help, and so, but not a single uniformed EMT. No back brace, no stretcher, no nothing. They go off the air with a bunch of the boys wringing their hands, going, should we give her CPR? Yeah, I can touch her tits that way. This was... It, it, it was a great RKO, a great physical angle. If it had had promos by both Randy Orton and Beth Phoenix from the heart about any issue that could potentially be believable between Randy and Edge, this would have been fantastic and would have built pay-per-view matches and interest and attention but it was a great RKO and a great physical angle preceded by shit they didn't believe, said in a fashion that they didn't buy, and it the end result was the fans cheered wildly when the heel attacked the babyface's fucking wife. So I'd say that was a fucking F, and not because of the talent. Once again, because of the fucking writers and these fucking Hollywood fucking morons. Ugh. The whole show is formatted so poorly. So that's that. And how that many is... weeks does the show end where you act like where you're like, oh, I just wasted three hours watching this shit. Here's my notes. There we go. Like there's so nothing that. rewarding. There's nothing that makes you want to come back and watch more. Next week, we're starting SmackDown. We're gonna freshen this thing up a little bit. It can't be worse than Raw. So now we've saved AEW because the good program of the week. Did you ever think I'd say that? <clears throat> this was the best program they have done to me because of the ratio of good stuff versus stupid stuff. And I guess that's the only way I can say it is they kept stupid to a, a closely to a minimum on this program and actually did some good things, but there was some... Anyway, let's go over it, shall we? Did you have any further co closing thoughts about Raw? I hope I never have to watch it again. Okay. Uh, in terms of SmackDown, which I'm not looking forward to, how are we doing... I mean, we're recording this... Uh, to break kayfabe for a second here, we're recording <laughs> this on Thursday for a Friday release. Will we review next week the SmackDown that airs tomorrow night? Is that what we're doing? I guess we'll have to do that, won't we? Because I ain't changing our day just for this fucking show. No, we're not. No, it's not like it's going to be fucking news. I have a feeling it'll be as boring as usual, and then our review will give it some life so people can wait for it. What's good is worth waiting for, whatever they say. I said it a few weeks back when we first started watching Raw, and it's funny, the watching of Raw has coincided with what I imagine is Tony Khan kind of firming up what he wants his show to be an AEW show has gotten better and better since the new year and AEW I now look forward to seeing what's going to be on that show raw that ended I don't want to watch it again <laughs> so it says something right there about what's happening but anyway, let's uh, let's get to I, and I'm I must agree that there's still an element of morbid curiosity to me in AEW, but I'm interested in obviously in anything MJF does. I want to see Jericho, fucking Cody. They have created some some interest in some people. Except, well, we'll I may be unpopular here in a minute. We'll get and to and their this. stupidity. Look, there's still a lot of stupid shit that shouldn't be on national TV. However, even that. They've kind of whittled away some of it. We haven't seen Jelly Nutella on national TV in a few weeks. Now that I say that, he'll be on next week's show. Right? Wait, yeah, of course. We and, haven't uh, seen Jimmy no. Havoc on the show in, in since Excalibur Ooh, well, him out. Has anybody heard? Did he lose so much weight he floated off? Or, well, you know, you never know. We might not be able to find him. They still have pockets. They still have the dork order. They've introduced Boom Boom Cult Cabana into this <sighs> carnival. But beyond the stupid shit that's there... Their stupid shit is slightly better than a WWE yeah. stupid shit. And there's also really good shit that's much better than they, the WWE shit. Because it feels, I don't want to say it feels real, but it doesn't feel written. Well, that's that's because they're, you know, the boys are doing this in large part. And I, I see that, but they, there's a trap they may be starting to fall into, but we we will go over this. Starting with the Moxley entrance, he's over. What a fucking ovation. He milked it well. He did a good baby face promo. The belt belongs to the fans deal. AEW brought pro wrestling back. 
that I wrote that would be a great line with without stunt pockets and Riho on the the show. But this was a very good wrestling promo, and it was more natural than anything that was on Raw. By the way, we right? haven't seen Riho in weeks either. Well, I have a feeling that's going to come to an end. It's it, <laughs> all good things can't last forever. But anyway, um, he did a good babyface wrestling promo and had some emotion to it. And then here comes Jericho in the inner circle. I love the sing along, except he's a heel. But goddamn, he's over, and it makes a great atmosphere. I did, was Moxley ever over to a a crowd or a group in the WWF like he is with this crowd? He was over, but never to this degree. And. And Jericho's having a fucking ball, as you can tell, and he does a great promo. And, I mean, you know, you suck ass. He can make a chant or a shirt or a catchphrase out of anything. Um, I loved the heel promo. He used the one eye. I trained for a one-eyed man excuse. I mean, just all the old tricks. Uh, knocking the town, the whole nine yards. Um, and somehow they – the only thing I was just – it this wasn't – probably done as plain as it could be because it was a little unwieldy but the stipulation that they formed was that if moxley was able to walk out of the building under his own power that night that jericho would leave AEW for 60 days and i i I think they forced that in since they didn't actually do it if he'd been going on the fozzy tour and they fuck i can't get back you know that might have been something but they didn't really do it so i think they were just looking for a a hook for the the main event, and the, I think they should have ended on Jericho's go home line. You're not as smart as you think you are, but instead they gave it back to Moxley, and he had to kind of pick it back up and shovel it back, and he got a pop at the end, but it would have been more natural and more dramatic to get out on Jericho, hit some music, and fucking go to black or whatever. Well, go to see, I thought it was the other way. I thought because he just lost the title, and because everyone knows that Fozzie has a tour coming up. And even the fans, you heard them chanting, you know, they knew it was Fozzie having a tour coming up. It kind of led you to believe that Jericho was going to lose that night. So in that way, like if it was the WWE, they would have set it up for Jericho to lose that night. Well, but then why did Jericho mention it himself instead of Moxley somehow forcing him into it? Is what I just, I, I don't know the way they did it and then they didn't do it. I see what I, you're you know, I see, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it. Everybody thought it was going to happen, then it didn't happen, but it, it then why did fucking Jericho bring it up to I don't know. It was a little unwieldy there, but everybody was good. <laughs> I'm not trying to tear that apart. I'll tear some other things apart here in a second. But but these guys are over in their stars. And you know, and it had life to it. And and it, because the guys were using a lot of their own words, it moved along and it didn't feel so fucking stagey and like a goddamn, you know, community theater thing like on Raw. But then, here we go, uh, schizophrenic, from the penthouse to the outhouse, SCU versus, uh, or, or SCU, all three of them, and Colt Cabana, versus Dork Order, Grayson, Pizzeria Uno, and the Silver and Reynolds, whoever and whyever, they're wearing fucking masks, and they're five foot three inches tall. And they say that the dork, dork Order is the number one ranked team in all elite wrestling. So they are not only not giving up on this, but they still think that somehow this is, whole thing's a good idea. Um, Cabana's in rare form. He can work, and he can move for a guy that size, but every facial has to be laughing and funny, and all of his body language has to be goofy and funny. It has to be with he can't. It doesn't have to be, but he just insists on it being. He can't do it any other. He can't bring himself to just do anything straight, really. And so he laughed through an opening spot, and then suddenly the heels just stopped everybody all at the same time. Remember that? They all just ran in and knocked SCU off the apron and just took over on Colt. And then Grayson and Uno got fucked up and couldn't figure out how to double shoot Colt off for their double team that they obviously had called. And at first, Grayson was on the right side, but then he switched to the left, and then he switched back to the right. And what the fuck? SCU's on the floor forever from just being knocked off the apron. Then suddenly the faces jump in and take over again. And then SCU does a spot where, in assembly line fashion, they tag each other on the apron. In other words, whoever's in the ring tags the guy on the apron. 
The guy on the apron moves over and gets ready to jump over the top and tags the guy on the apron next to him and then jumps over the top and does a move. And then that guy gets ready to jump over and tags the guy on the apron next to him and jumps over and does a move. Here's the problem. You can't fucking do that. You cannot fucking do that. Never in the history of wrestling in any territory, any company, or any fucking rule book can the guy that has been tagged on the apron tag anybody else until he gets into the fucking ring. Can you imagine all the things that the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, and Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson and Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart and the Fantastics and all the great tag teams in the 80s and Bockwinkle and Stevens and Stevens and Patterson and Bruiser and fucking Crusher, for Christ's sake. All the things that all those people could have done if they were just going out to do whatever the fuck they wanted to because it was cool or it was a cool idea whether it meant made any sense in the fucking context of what they were supposed to be doing or not. And I like these guys as athletes and as talents, but I hate this fucking gimmick, the singing, the dancing, the microphone, the happy horseshit, ha ha. And then the, the modern matches where they've lost everything they knew about actual wrestling and working because they've just quit trying. So anyway, they did that tag spot, which is not a thing. And then all the baby faces beat up the heels. Then they stopped Daniels. And then their heat buried the referee because the heels just blatantly beat the fuck out of Daniels in front of the referee. Then they went to a break. Then they come back from the break and the mass guys give Daniels five double team moves before he could take one fucking bump in a row. Bing, bing, bing. And then uh, suddenly he and the heel are both down and he gives Kazarian a cold tag from five feet away. And then Frankie makes a comeback, and an eight-way breaks out. I don't know what they're all fucking doing, I wrote. Cabana made a comedy comeback. Then he hit a nice-looking fucking move uh, where he picked the guy up in fireman's carry on the buckles and dropped and dropped him across the ropes, which looks like it hurts, probably does, and then followed that up with that stupid Superman fucking pin to make it funny. One, two, three. Then... Pizzeria Uno gets the microphone and complains that the exalted one is going to be pissed off and heads will roll. This was a quote. Heads will roll. And not a single person in the crowd gave a shit and Colt was in the ring laughing at the heels as usual. <laughs> so what the fuck was done there of any fucking good for anybody? They cut yeah. they cut bait on the Nightmare Collective, which was a good move. The Dark Order have to be next. The, their fans don't care about the Dark Order. If their fans are rejecting something, that says something. Because they accept anything. Well, they're the redheaded stepchild of AEW. That's, that's like not even being able to get the, the fucking class whore to fuck you the night of the prom. If those people don't like something. Anyway, then they, uh, this coming up, and everybody said he said he liked this show. Well, I'm getting to that part. They actually did a package on the Young Bucks and Omega and Page tag team match with quotes about the quality of the match from the newsletters about how great it was, including Uncle Dave and Brian Alvarez and the fucking torch dipshit they actually put quotes from wrestling newsletters about how great their match was work-wise on national television. The, 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 the inmates may not be running the asylum, but the marks have finally taken over the wrestling business. I was waiting for a quote from you. For the kind of people that huh. like that, <laughs> the kind of, kind of thing. That's the kind of thing. I was <laughs> Somebody needs to redo that video. Somebody redo that video and put it up. For the kind of people who like this kind of thing, it's the kind of thing those people like. Jim Cornette, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> just self-serving. If it was Sports Illustrated saying one of the great athletic confrontations of all time, that but it was even Justin Brasso from Sports Illustrated saying, "Well, oh, it was such a great match. The action." Because it was a phony fucking performance. They're they're putting ratings of a phony performance up. In, uh, they hell. care a lot about, and this isn't across the board, but in a lot of cases, they care a lot about courting wrestling media and wrestling influencers and getting them on their side. And this is the kind influencers. of Influencers. 
That's another fucking phrase that makes me want to see people that use it raped with a rusty fishing knife. Influencers. Who the fuck? You know who influences me? If my if I go to my doctor and I say I'm sick and he says you need to take some fucking medicine, that's an that's influential. He has influenced me to go pay for this medicine I'm supposed to take to not fucking die. But somebody influenced me on my opinion about something when they don't know as much about it as I do, probably fuck them and fuck their influence. They couldn't pull a greasy string out of a cat's ass with me. Anyway, speaking of which, next was Big Swole versus Leva Bates. Brian, this was worse than the Linda Miles match that I never aired on Ohio Valley Wrestling Television. Oh, come on. <laughs> that's, that's hard yes, for me to believe. Yes, it was. Did you see what the, it looked like a goddamn fucking uh, chicken fucking a roller skate? I don't, at some point when the, it didn't go long and they had that stupid fucking guy librarian minimized, but big swoles greener to pepper tree and it, it just didn't come together and it was what it was. At least it was short. It was very short, and I reiterate, AEW's women's division is a waste of time. They did not need a women's division. I like Britt Baker as a personality, but even her, I don't think she's ready for prime time in the ring. But I do get a kick out of her busting Tony Schiavone's balls. See, well, uh, Britt Baker would have benefited from an OVW television, Just like Tammy Sitch benefited from Smoky Mountain television, like uh, a number of the girls that, including Beth Phoenix, benefited from OVW, to, for a local television where it's not the end of the world if you're a little green, but you still get yelled at if you fuck up. And as a transition, you can't just go from doing shows on the independence and no structure of any kind of television program or at a major level, it just tape shit that happens. You can't just suddenly jump onto TNT. And a lot of these talents are having to do that. They could have benefited from a good quality, old-fashioned training program that would prepare them for shit like this. But anyway. Do you think AEW should find someone to partner with or just, you know, buy outright that is a small company with a small TV show or a small internet show even. Well, just something to train people who aren't ready for TV. To but good God, who's, who's going to train people to be ready for TV when they're putting people on TV that ain't ready for fucking TV because they're not ready to book TV? The only one that knows what he's doing is fucking Cody. It, 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 whatever input Jericho is giving, the rest of them have never done a fucking television show in their life. You think Kenny Omega was picking up any production tips from the New Japan show or he was just watching video games to prepare for his big Tokyo Dome matches? It's a whole different animal. And they need to anticipate that these things are going to happen. They need to see the match in their head. They need to understand that they're not formatting in some cases correctly. And they have let nepotism and friendship influence some of their talent decisions. Because of which we will talk about here shortly, but let's get to the good parts. Back to the good parts. Cody and MJF package didn't have any newsletter quotes. It had blood and drama and was a serious package for a serious match that got the point across that MJF, the man who stabbed Cody in the back, was the winner of that match and he fucked him. And then Cody comes out for the promo and he's fucking over. And besides the fact that even wearing a suit, you can still see that fucking neck tattoo that will be forever be known as, as uh, the most questionable decision a top babyface ever made. Cody's boner. Good God. Uh, I like his promos. They're different. He has a cadence like Dusty did without the jive. He's, he's I, I know sometimes you say he's overly dramatic or cinematic or whatever, but he's got those ups and downs in the part where he spits out a line and the part where he pulls it back a little bit. He doesn't have Dusty's lisp, but he doesn't have Dusty's drawl, and he doesn't have the the, the jiving, shucking, jiving, you know, uh, superstar Billy Graham slash Tom Boogaloo shaft bit, but he, he it's still the Rhodes way of talking, just updated. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I can see that. And and I like it compared to he's different. He's different from everybody on this program, and he's different from most people. And he gets it out, and he makes the point, and the people like it. Here comes Jake, and he looks pissed. 
See, I gave you that one. Wow. Hit it out of the park. Noted piss drinker, Jake Roberts. God damn it. I didn't expect Jake, right? Or, or his to, haircut. To be, to be the one to interrupt. And that's why I was going to ask, why is one side of Jake's head <laughs> shaved? It looks like he's the one that got soma on a plane. And, and <laughs> He's on the other side of it for once and fucking got shaved or whatever. But, I, but anyway, well, here's a I, question for you. If Jake's a big surprise coming out, why do they have, it's not the Titan Tron, but why do they have a video ready to go with his logo and his name and music ready? Well, yes, that's another thing because they, they think the television production is more important than making people believe in the product and fooling people. In, and 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 uh, removing their sus uh, allowing them to suspend their disbelief, et cetera, et cetera. Everything's got to be so overly fucking. It, it, you could have done the same thing with Jake standing up from the fucking fourth row and walking over the fucking rail, because everybody would have known as soon as they saw him who it fucking was. But it, it, it his voice is shot from whatever his habits have been, but he can still cut a promo. And that's something you wanted to, I really, I wish his voice was better because I wanted it to have the power that it did before. And it's a little fucking painful to listen to that every once in a while. Uh, but he can cut a promo and tell a story and he can sell. So he has a client coming now knowing them, they could fumble this and it could be a fucking popcorn fart. But if it's somebody really fucking good, then this could be something, right? The rumors are it's either Lance Archer or Brody Lee, who was formerly Luke Harper in WWE. Those are the rumors. It could be someone okay, else. Okay, well, Lance Archer is was Lance... God damn it. What was his name? I don't remember now. In Lance, TNA. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't remember. I know him. Lance... Not, I'm saying Lance Cade in my head. Not Lance Cade, obviously. But I know Lance. I can't remember what his former name was. But he was he's a he's a big guy. He can fucking move. I haven't seen him work in several years, so I'm you know, I know he's been doing a different thing in fucking Japan or whatever, but I don't know if if just because Brody Lee has been on WWE television, whether that's the right fit there, because didn't they have they beat him to powder or marginalized him like everybody else that ever leaves there? They didn't book him correctly, but he's also he was one of those guys, I believe, that was off TV for months before they actually let him go. Uh, okay, well then in that case, maybe he, you know, he might be halfway fucking fresh. And, and there was a bit of a dispute that I think their fan base is probably aware of where he wanted out of his contract and they wouldn't let him go for a while. Well, damn their eyes. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Jake's got a client coming and he'd turn his back on Cody. And if, you know, if Jake's straightened up and he shows up for everything... And the guy's good. This could be interesting. He's lucky. You know, Jake said, you never turn your back on someone you're afraid of or someone you respect. And then he turned his back. Cody's lucky he did that because Jake's way of showing respect, as talked about on 605 Super Podcast, <laughs> is drinking his own piss. Well, but that's when he was in a, a high state of inebriation. Or an inebriated state of highness, one or the other. <laughs> I don't know if he does that since he's straightened up. That's anyway, why his voice sounds that way. <laughs> that's, that, that piss is terrible on the vocal cords. It's very acidic. I tweeted out what Cody should do to counteract Jake is bring Honky Tonk Man. Because Jake yeah. blames half of the things that happened wrong in his life on Honky Tonk. It's Honky Tonk Man. Everything's Honky Tonk Man's fault. Bring Honky Tonk Man. Throw Jake off his game. He could hit him with the guitar again. Anyway. And Jake will claim um, it was not gimmick. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Why? Uh, what has Pac done? Why do they hate Pac? On the pay-per-view, they give him my little dog pockets. They then show highlights of pockets kicking a shit out of Pac on this program. They didn't show the finish, thank goodness. Um, but then they booked Pac against Chuck Taylor. Another one of the best friends. The only one that looks like an athlete is Trent, formerly last name Beretta, now man with no last name. The only one that can work is fucking Trent. So they put Pac in to be humiliated by being competitive with a guy with his hands in his pockets, and now they put him against this fucking hatchet-headed cretin. <laughs> who, Jim Ross spent the first minute slyly suggesting that Chuck Taylor get in a fucking gym. 
He looks horrible. He has a lazy shoot off where he just points the guy in that direction. It doesn't go with him. He tried to do some gymnastics, but it, it, he's trying to to do all that fucking fancy indie shit that the athletes do, and he muddles through it somehow. But still, it, the his muffin top is hideous to me. It's all I can look at. Chuck Taylor's looks like Dave Lagana if he bought a treadmill. <laughs> But God, I mean, it's flopping over his fucking tights. And everybody said, well, Cornette, you're not. To, well, I don't go out in my goddamn spandex underwear on national TV either and play a professional athlete. Now, do I? Um, it, And when I did, I was supposed to look like shit because I was a manager. This guy's supposed to be a professional wrestler. The fucking thing is, Pac was, and then he, he's having to sell for this fucking guy. Pac looks like a badass. He's in fucking great shape. His work looks tremendous. Great promo. The great promo, the fucking psychology is off here. The heel is outnumbered three to one. Pack has nobody out there. The baby faces have everybody. Now Chuck Taylor is doing the head palm shoot off into the ropes. And Pack go just a lazy fuck, Chuck Taylor. And Pack goes with it. <clears throat> Indie level chops. I wrote down Pack is selling for this clown. Why are they burying Pack? And then Pack takes over and they go to the break. And they come back on a hold where we've missed the bulk of Pax Heat. And then Taylor starts a lame-ass comeback. I wrote down here, he wouldn't have made OVW TV in 2004. He would not have been in the top 22 performers on the developmental roster in 2004. I would have not put him on my local television program until he got in the gym, improved his look, and improved his basics and did something about that ridiculous haircut and that stupid, geeky fucking smile on his face. Then uh, Pac took a few bumps. Go back and watch this if anybody cares. Watch Pac take two or three bumps in a row for Chuck Taylor where he had to take the bump and then jump up and get set in position for what was next so that Chuck Taylor could make a comeback. And I don't mean that everybody does that in every match, yes. But no, obviously. Like, come here. Clothesline me over the top rope now. I've just positioned myself. He was hand-feeding, spoon-feeding, and leading this guy by the nose through this fucking thing. Then they kept going. It, it was it, By this time, it was so old. And then Pac hits an RKO over the top rope <clears throat> on Chuck Taylor, boom, and plants him, and immediately... Chuck Taylor recovers and drops Pac straight on his fucking head with some goddamn ill-conceived fucking thing and got a two count. And then he missed a moonsault and Pac tapped him out. This was rotten. And I think they've buried Pac as a legitimate Jericho, Moxley, MJF, Cody, top guy level attraction that he could have been. That's where, just, That's where he was. That's where he was when he first started out. He, he tapped out Omega. Okay, well, now he's involved with fucking, you know, dog and pony show and, and middle card guys that he's no better than and he's working competitively with. And then he was going to face off with Orange Cassidy again, and here comes the Lucha Brothers. And the Lucha Brothers and Pac have joined forces. All those other fucking British or Irish and fucking Mexican, you know, coalitions that have worked so well in the past. And they've already got a name, the death triangle, because somebody in booking is a fucking Mark and likes to name shit. Apparently. Because for these guys to suddenly have put the group together when they look like they can't even fucking speak to each other. And they've never been associated past the last week. And suddenly they have a group name. That means somebody in the booking committee or office or whatever is a mark that likes to name shit. And then they did a double team to Orange Cassidy, hopefully a career-ending fucking double team, and announced their goddamn biz. I What the fuck? Seriously? Other than Moxley, and I guess maybe Darby Allen, in terms of the guys on the main show, not the YouTube show, I don't watch that, is everyone in a faction? Apparently, well, now it's the only way to survive in this dog eat dog world. <laughs> this it's a dog eat dog world, and if you're not in a faction, you're wearing milk bone underwear, motherfucker. 
Speaking of factions, now we, you could actually you can submit to join factions here, join teams and factions and managers because they go from this deal to Sean Spears and Tully Blanchard, which uh, who have disappeared in recent weeks. This first time I think Tully's spoken on their television. Maybe they just got out of jail. I don't know where they've been. <laughs> They're searching for a partner for Sean Spears on Twitter. Did I read this right? Did I hear this right? Uh, you heard it correctly. Yes. What the fuck? Is, is what is this? Make a wish? You've got Tully Blanchard, one of the four horsemen. You got Sean Spears. Burp, burp. See, I'm getting the sour belches over this. <laughs> Sean Spears is supposed to be a fucking top guy that was it caved Cody's head in with a chair, and now they're like, we can't find a partner. Can it, 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 submit your application on Twitter? We're gonna pick some fucking goof on Twitter. What? <sighs> Then QT Marshall, they nobody can say his name right. It's QT Marshall faces Jake Hager. And this is a great opportunity because QT Marshall, of course, is is a friend of Cody's. Hager's the fucking enforcer in the inner circle. He's got Santana and Ortiz at ringside. QT Marshall has Dustin, Cody's brother, and Brandy, Cody's wife. Why would Brandy come out? With QT Marshall, I can, okay, I can, you, they can make the case, even though it was too dangerous for a woman to be out there, that she came out with her husband to support him and give him moral support in the fight of his life, but now she's just accompanying a family friend to a fight with an, a fucking MMA fighter and two dangerous goddamn Puerto Ricans off the street of, of New York, and she's not worried? She's going to get on that show one way or another. QT Marshall is a good, solid worker. He's perfect to give a guy to give Hager a fight and still put him over. I mentioned we've, you know, found QT. We had our eye on QT and brought him up to Ring of Honor back in 2012. Everybody laughed because he was a full-grown man and didn't do flips like the Ring of Honor roster. Now everybody loves him. Uh, but he's a good worker, but he was there to put Jake Hager over, and he did. But the people are already chanting Jericho's bitch. This was a perfect match because Hager looked dominant and QT Marshall sold. Then he made a nice comeback and he got a good false finish. So he's a, a baby face. It wasn't just didn't have their somebody wipe their feet on him. But then Hager clotheslined the shit out of him and got the triangle choke. I hate that fucking choke because one guy's not dominantly down and one up. But if they're going to do it, they need to go with it. And that was perfect and to the point. And then, as far as a match, nobody actually just wins good, decent, competitive five-minute matches and gets over anymore. And that's how all the previous generation stars got over. All previous generation stars got over that way. Do you have anything to add before we go to the afterbirth? No, I agree with you about the choke. I mean, I think we said it during the pay-per-view review. If they're going to do it, go all the way with it. And we saw it here, and then we see it again in the next segment. It's not even the Shinonomaki where you can see the fucking heel's maniacal face and he can jerk the guy around, the Cobra Clutch, for those of you so inclined. It's just, it's a close thing. You can't see a good facial expression and both guys are semi-up. It looks like a top wrist lock. I know it's a shoot hold, but it's not very picturesque. Um, But then the heels jump on Dustin. And they start getting some heat on Dustin, and here comes Cody and makes a big save. And I love this shit because he was cooking. And then Ortiz gets Cody with the fucking chair. And now they get Cody down. And apparently they were saying that Nick Buck and or o Olivier were neither one there, which maybe is why I thought this was the best show that they've done. But here comes Matt, all five foot eight and 180 pounds of him to fucking super kick everybody. But then Hager shut him down. And I wrote, this is good shit. They were, and then here comes Paige walking out with a beer. I must say it, it, this is one of those things. It worked in this instance. Yes. I think it's stupid that a guy would walk down to the ring when his friends were in trouble and not spill his beer and then make the comeback a big surprise. And, there's an element of contrivedness to this, but at the same time, Paige has made it work and it, it worked for that crowd and it worked in that environment. 
And I don't care about anybody else but Cody anyway, so I liked the whole thing with Paige. <laughs> but when he made the big comeback, the heels fed him lousy. Did you see that? He had to go to them, and they half-ass fed and half -ass, They could have taken big bump. I don't know who produced it, that segment, but I would have made sure when Paige waded into them that each one had a big bump to take through or over the ropes to leave Hager there for the fucking confrontation where finally Hager gets the better of him, but tosses him out, but he hits that buckshot, big fucking pop. <clears throat> He's over with those people. And then he drinks beer and flips Matt off and leaves. I like that. And that that's why I wrote what you were talking about earlier. There's a lot more life in this show than raw. And if they made better choices or more realistic choices about their underneath talent, and shorten some things up and got some points across on television, they'd be doing fine. You know, they're both live, but Raw doesn't feel live. This feels like a live show. Anything could happen. Yes, well, Raw is so pre-choreographed, manipulated, staged, and produced down to the nub that there's no out-of-control element about it whatsoever. And Paige, is, if they're not careful, Paige is going to be the most over guy in the whole company. Well, hopefully they won't notice for another couple months, and he will be. Because I'm afraid one of the fucking brain trust will try to shut him down a little bit. But anyway, next was a promo with MJF and Wardlow. I have seen them do these expensive, spooky-looking things with Darby Allen on location. They've done these other pre tape This did this look like it was shot on a fucking camcorder? They're just in a black room. That's all you can see is them, and it wasn't even. It didn't even look high def. It looked like my old Smoky Mountain stuff with the high eight millimeter camera. Yeah, and you know they had, I guess Dallas Page's daughter is that female interviewer the last several weeks backstage. I I did not know that. And basically, if you know Dallas Page, you have a job with AEW. That's what it's <laughs> come down to. Because of the Cody connection. But and she's not bad. I'm not saying that. But why not have her there? I mean, that's the other thing. I thought it would have been more effective if it wasn't just, we have a cameraman, so we're going to do a promo and then end the promo. Yeah. I, I, well, like, it, it, I like it, promos it, with announcers holding a microphone. Also, there was so much long stuff on his program, he couldn't have come outside and, and saw the people in person. But anyway, the promo was fucking gold. Because MJF, if, if you, you know, fucking shoot him on old eight millimeter film. He'll still be great. Um, he knocked everybody. He did a nice heel promo and then he started to do his thing. I'm better than you and you, Hey, Wardlow, it's warm in here. And he takes off the fucking jacket. And he's got the, I pinned Cody shirt. It's like fucking, uh, uh, you know, I broke Wahoo's leg, the Greg Valentine t-shirt. Yeah. Cause and I'm sure it's an homage. MJF is a student he knocked neck tattoos. He mentioned Marco stunted growth. <laughs> <clears throat> so the promo was fabulous, but we got, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes of the fucking best speaker on the God in the promotion and on tape. So anyway, um, and of course the big main event and <sighs> some things I like and some things I didn't. And I, I said that I was putting this show over. This was a good show with parts in it that just aggravate me because they're unnecessary, but their main event guys and their top guys and the guys that they're really pushing that have a chance to get over are getting over and Jericho and Guevara against Darby Allen and Moxley had a little bit of both. Here's why I didn't like the start because after Darby Allen's entrance, Moxley's coming through the crowd again, but the inner circle as mass guys jump out of the crowd and attack him and beat him up into the concourse. They've got masks on. They could be anybody from the audience, but Atlas Security, nobody tries to intervene. They don't unmask themselves until they get in the concourse. You see on camera the security holding other regular fans back so this pre-planned, supposed, unplanned attack can take place. Then they go into the concourse and Moxley won't stay down. It reminded me of that fucking idiot Vic Grimes on Memphis TV one morning. I had to hit him over the head with a tennis racket as hard as I could 25 fucking times. He wouldn't stay down. And then I screamed at him and made him pay for me a new fucking racket. After I'd put knots on his fucking head because he, Moxley would not stay down too long, too much. 
I would have gotten a fucking bat or a tire tool to hit this motherfucker and almost any veteran in the world that I know of what he just kept coming up and it got ridiculous. It distracted from whatever point they were supposed to be making here, which was hopefully get Darby Allen over as a sympathetic underdog. But now he just had to stand in the ring for three minutes at least and watch on a screen as his supposed tag team partner got beaten up a hundred feet away over and over. And it wasn't like they hit him and they did something and they ran off where the, uh, there was nothing that could be done. They're actively doing it while Darby Allen is standing in the ring, watching the screen and he has to stand there because he's not supposed to do anything else. And then they start the match where of course it, now he's agreed to take them both on, but now he looks fucking stupid or it, lo or it looks like, why didn't he go to help? It, it, he's over and they've got something special with him, but this just made him look like a putz through no fault of his own. But then he cooks on both the heels because now, Jer now we're back in Jericho's in charge. I'm sure he was probably trying to telekinetically will fucking Moxley to stay his dumb ass down in 30 seconds so they could get to this fucking thing. But now Jericho, you can tell had a lot to do with this fucking match and they made Darby Allen. It looks so good and uh, such a better star. They, they, they let him cook for a minute, but then Guevara, and if you notice, Sammy was always the one to stop him. Cause why does Jericho need to fucking stop him? Sammy can stop him and they got heat on him and Jericho give him a little comeback, a little comeback, but then he got the walls of Jericho. And Darby Allen actually milked the rope break great facially and with fucking gestures. And that was actually a halfway decent break spot because now I'm interested. What the fuck is this fucking kid going to last or not? They go to the break. They come back. They continued the heat. Jericho was classic. The fans were getting bleeped. What were they just chanting? Fuck you. Fuck you over and over. Yeah, I didn't know. And I was dying to know what they were saying. I actually still don't know. They're going to have to start coming out and telling because I'm it, 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 TNT is going to get a memo from standards and practices just saying, hey, our fucking seven second delay fucking guy is pissed. And it sounds like shit when there's no audio for massive parts of our program. They're going to have to tell their fans, keep it television friendly uh, because it's just going to piss off the network. But anyway, <clears throat> um, then. Jericho and Sammy Guevara got the taunting heat on Darby Allen where they didn't hit him with every move under the fucking sun, especially Jericho. He's wiping his feet on him. He's kicking him in the face, but they're not hitting this little smaller guy two on one over and over with double team moves or with big moves that he has to kick out of. They're getting heat on him by pissing the fans off at treating him like a piece of shit, which is what they were supposed to be doing. And and then also it's not outrageous that Darby Allen can then make another comeback because they've kind of given him a break. And finally, suddenly, he does make a big comeback on Jericho, and that's when he hits that great dive where he dives through the ropes and actually hits the guy and knocks him into the fucking rail. Imagine that. And then they stopped him again. I wrote, this is a Jericho masterpiece. Because now each comeback that Darby has is a bigger one. Finally, the big comeback on Guevara, the big dive on all of them, where they splatter on the floor. That didn't come in the first two minutes of the match. It came in the last minute or two. <clears throat> and all the heels fall down like fucking bowling pins, and he gets a big pop, and then he hits uh, or goes for the big dive on Jericho. And, of course, God damn, they have got to... They've got to get their floor cameras, their producers, and their director all on the same page. And I don't know who all those people are. But they had the shot on one of the floor cameras of Jericho spinning and hitting Darby on the fly with the Judas, but they got a side floor camera shot of it, and that did not you couldn't see what happened. And even Shivani missed it because he was watching the monitor. But anyway, boom, he hits him with the Judas. He tosses him back in, and Sammy Guevara gets the pin because, once again, why does Jericho need it? So he's helping Sammy out. And then the heels start posing, and God damn it. Here comes this fucking Moxley again. Not bleeding. 
he's got a chair and he beats up all the heels and clears the ring before Hager blindsides him. And they fucking all beat him up and they take him up to the ramp and they power bomb him off the fucking stage 10 feet through a table. And I was like, if that motherfucker gets up, I'm going to go find him and run him down. I understand Moxley's supposed to be dangerous, but Jesus Christ, he's working like a fucking road warrior animal. And this was a good show, but with the, the predominant amounts of heat after the match and comebacks and run-ins and et cetera, are they getting dangerously close to hot shotting this early in the, the run? I know they want to have action happening, but at the same time, you got to gear it back and don't be busy when you don't have to be busy. So when you need a schmoz, the schmoz is, is different and is welcomed. But I, is this, is this, was this close to hot shotting it? Just constant chaos. I don't think it was hot shotting it with that audience. Well, but what about the audience they're trying to get on television? Do they want to make them think that, okay, we're going to see this. They set the precedent. We're going to see fucking chaos and schmozzes and heat after and afterbirths in the matches in at least half the segments. And then when they see that for three months in a row, what reaches them? Do they, then they have to do it in all the segments. I don't know how worried they are about, at this point, I don't know how worried they are about the audience beyond their audience. I think they're happy with their 900,000 or so, plus or minus each week, as an audience. And they're doing their show, and if TNT's happy with that and they're happy with that, that may just be what they're doing. Well, maybe Jake's client will be the answer to all of our problems. You know, who's it going to be? Shh, I can't tell you. Matt Hardy? No, it's going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> Jake has finally got me a spot where he's going to pay me back for that fucking uh, uh, goddamn all those houses he walked out on 25 years ago in Smoky Mountain. You can finally turn on him. Anyway, all right, well, that's what happened. What are your closing thoughts on that television program? Which was, like I said, there was a lot of good stuff there, and I was right now, this is good shit. The top guys are always good, and the bottom guys always suck. And it doesn't need to be that way. I like AEW singles division. And when I say singles division, everyone in that mix from the young guys like Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen, obviously MJF, Jungle Boy, who wasn't even on this show this week, to the guy. I mean, I, can you can you imagine just for a second? Hold on a second, because a lot of people are saying, well, for that audience, Orange Cassidy, for that audience, Orange Cassidy. OK, for that audience, j- if you're on Broadway at a, a fucking a huge theater doing an English drawing room play, do you suddenly break out in the fucking train chimps because they're an entertaining thing to watch also? It doesn't fit in that environment. If they had taken the TV time and the effort they have put into a guy sticking his hands in his pockets and put that into Jungle Boy going out there and triumphing over some adversity almost every week, then Jungle Boy would be just as over with that audience as Pockets, and he wouldn't be detrimental to the overall genre of the program. And besides that, for fuck's sake, you know, if if somebody coming out and taking a shit in the middle of the ring got a, a rousing ovation from that audience, would you still want to fucking do it every week? And what happens when he's just taking the same amount of shit every week? But it, I, I just think that if they if they put that much effort and time into something else that would not detract from the rest of their program, then it I don't think anybody in that building would have set the seats on fire if Pockets was not on the program. They cheer when he's there, but they would have cheered Jungle Boy too, and you could build him into something that means something. If the Ding Dongs had somehow inexplicably gotten over and sold merch, would it still have been the right move to push them? I guess that's kind of the orange. That is that is the rhetorical question that we are asking in a nutshell. But I like what AEW's top guys and singles division guys and young guys bring to the table. I actually look forward to seeing what's going on with all that. The women's division to me is a total loss, and I don't need to watch those segments, and those are typically the segments where I can kind of zone out. I think the tag team division 
I really enjoyed the Young Bucks, Omega, and Page match. And I really like Omega and Page as a team because of the dynamic there. And I love Page. I think Page, he finally won me over. And he's got that buckshot lariat over. And he's over with their fans more now than he was six months ago. But other than that, I don't want to see SCU anymore. And I think Scorpio Sky is tremendously talented. Yeah. I don't need to see the Dork Order ever again. <laughs> I Oh, and the Butcher Baker and Candlestick Maker. Next week, MJF is with the Butcher Baker and Candlestick Maker against... Who was it? Lucha, Wait a minute. The I'm Lucha... Uh, not the Lucha. The uh, oh, Jurassic yeah. Express. The Jurassic... So that means that... <laughs> The Jungle Boy will be the lost guy. The the money in that team will be the lost guy because everybody will look at the big guy, Luchasaurus, for the big spots, and they'll laugh at stunted growth for doing the fucking goofy shit. So the biggest star of the bunch of those three, Jungle Boy, the one that has the most upside, will be marginalized because he's not the littlest sympathetic baby face on the team, but he's not the big ass kicker. He's just the guy in the middle. He's like fucking Chip. On my three sons, he's the kid in the middle that gets the least camera time. And there's an example, Butcher and, and the Blade, great look. At least, you know, the Butcher has one. I don't think they've won a single match since they've been in there. They were brought in as MJF's, you know, not bounty hunters, but his backup, and they've lost every single time they've been on TV. And wh- how do they look like that MJF, this prick kid from fucking... Long Island would have anything to fucking do with these people. Him and Wardlow, yes. But they just pair people up that would have no, well, no reason to interact with each other in real life. There was a very theatrical little segment where MJF showed up in their butcher shop and handed them a... Well, I, I, know, I know that, but, I'm, but no, that's completely ridiculous. Uh, the great factions, whether it be DX or the Four Horsemen or whatever the fuck, look like people that would be fucking hanging out with each other. I thought the dynasty in, in MLW is great, MJF and Richard Holiday and Alexander Hammerst- Hammerstone, because they interacted with each other and had person. even though each one was different, they had personalities that looked like they would be a group of like college jock fucking assholes. That worked. That was a great group. I don't why the fuck that exact group is not on national television. I have no idea besides the fact that Tony Khan don't want to spend any money to get him away from Court Bauer. Uh, but it's lunacy that that group wasn't intact or isn't on national television. Yeah, Hammerstone uh, should be on AEW TV. Well, good God, uh, you know, all through Holiday is underrated because he was in between Hammerstone and MJF. But he added to the group, and he and he's got his own thing, and he does his own different shit. But the point is that group, and I'm not trying to downplay the relevance of MLW, but that group was on MLW TV, and a billionaire gets into business, and he's plucking people from all over the world, and that fucking group doesn't transfer. Oh my god! Jeez. But you know, my point is, there's all this I like in AEW, but then there's the other side, and, and it it creates a weird environment when you're watching the show. Like I'm okay with Marco stump being the mascot slash manager for the Jurassic Express. Okay. Well then I will, I will give you a Bobby Heenan line. When he tried to smarten his mother up that the wrestling business was a work. And she said, honey, I knew that. Do you think I'd think anybody was stupid and left to let you manage them? <laughs> what what good would Marco stunt be except a liability, a small child hanging around getting in fucking trouble? He he can't talk for him. He wouldn't be their business manager. What do they need a mascot for? Keep the fucking attention on the young babyface superhero for the future, Jungle Boy. That's got all the fucking tools and all the attraction, and his big lug headed fucking partner that is the big cleanup guy that that does the power shit. The, the fucking idiot kid, the village idiot kid, detracts and does nothing for him in any way, shape, or form. You see, the thing that really bothers me is him being competitive in these matches that go a long time and no one can finish him off. Well, no, him it's being ridiculous. in these matches. It's ridiculous. Just, just, just the idea of him being sanctioned to compete athletically against these full-grown men makes the whole scenario visually preposterous. And people can see, can poke holes in it a mile away. If Jungle Boy at 160 pounds was the fucking small one that everybody was pushing around and taking advantage of, that's how he gets his sympathy. 
And then he's a good looking kid and a good looking athlete that overcomes adversity and fucking has guts and wins in the end in some type of Hail Mary fashion and a, a Cinderella story out of nowhere. But instead, this fucking idiot glorified midget is running around doing these goofy spots with these guys that are flinging themselves around for him, and it makes the whole thing gaga. So it's a Jungle Boy should fucking garrot Marco Stunt in his sleep if Jungle Boy wants to have a successful career in professional wrestling. Because right now, Marco Stunt is an anchor around Jungle Boy's fucking neck, and he's in the jungle in a goddamn pile of quicksand. And that's something you don't see on TV enough these days like you used to back in the 70s is a good fucking pit of quicksand. <laughs> and with <laughs> and with MJF, I am such a fan of his, and they've done so much right with him, but they've also done a lot wrong with him. They've made him look weak at times where I thought it was a mistake, but also now that it's been shown that he's one of the biggest ratings movers on that show, why do you have him in a two-minute promo? Why isn't he out there for an entire segment each and every show? If he's not in a match, have him on the platform, on the stage, doing a promo or just doing something. Why you is know he in what, a two-minute backstage promo? He's one you know of the guys what he could carry off. You know what he could carry off? Piper's he could do pit. something. Well, no, no. Yes, he could do that too, but something that only Lawler has ever done, to my knowledge, and he did it on the old WWF TV back in the, the mid-'90s when he was doing the stuff with Bret Hart do commentary on his own match. He would work with the job guy and he would actually, and he made it believable. And I think MJF is probably the only other human walking the earth that could pull this off to where he could have the match with the micro stick microphone doing his own commentary and get three or four or five minutes out. And of course ends up getting bumped on his ass and blah, blah, blah. And then he gets serious and wins, but he could do both. He could do his own fucking commentary, but I mean, he's on TMZ. It would be, it would be better than best friends. Of course. Well, anyone would. But he's on TMZ this week, and then he's in a two-minute segment. So anyone who says, well, who is this guy? I've never seen him before. I don't know what AEW is. Because believe it or not, there's still a lot of people who don't know what AEW is. And they say, let me check this out. He's barely on the show. Yeah, well, and, and you know, that's not even being anti-AEW. Because when Kurt Angle was in TNA, and he started there in 2006... So uh, 2007, they're on Spike TV. They're doing twice as many people as AEW is doing now for the rating because of the way times have changed. And every time Kurt would go through the airport, people still, like, when did you quit wrestling? Because they just didn't know TNA was there. And, and it, it's the same thing at Ring of Honor. When they got on Sinclair television stations, the people who knew to look for it was the initial audience, and it took months, if not years, for more people outside that bubble to find out that Ring of Honor was a thing and was around. It's not knocking the promotion. It's just it takes a while, once you get regular television, to spread your fucking word. Anyway. Those are my thoughts. But, I, well, but you know what? I, look, I, I can actually tell you right now that I think the show has gotten – much better since the beginning of the year. Since that dork order ending where they, whatever, he stuck his finger in the buck's mouth and pulled out blood, whatever. Well, it's, whatever hey, they've, they've really, they've, they've been steadily trending upward since the JoJo, the dog face boy and the legless wonder were in the battle Royal. So yes, they right. have been getting <laughs> yeah. better because they, they set the bar so low at the beginning that it's kind of hard not to fucking hop over that bad boy. But but, but it, yes. feels, it feels alive, not just live, but it feels alive. Yeah. And I can actually say I look forward to watching it now. Even though this stuff I'm going to really not like on the show, there's enough. For every bad thing, there's something that's not just good, but better than anything on WWE TV. That's true. And they've been listening to this program so much, and they've adopted so many of our ideas that the program is really, really coming along now. <laughs> And see, I just I just said that simply so that, that that quote can be out there on YouTube and everything and all those fucking whiny little bitch all all elite wrestling fans that don't like our style of program can go, oh, he's so insufferable. Well, what do you think now after watching three weeks of Raw? Like comparing that and we watched NXT and we're about to do SmackDown, but at least... Well, yeah, no, it, 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 no. In every way, all elite wrestling has more fire and more life and is more exciting than Raw. Um, and, and I can't even say the same thing about Raw as I was saying about NXT. 
that the the level of training and uh, athleticism and execution is higher on NXT across the board than it is on AEW because those those kids have been trained to death. Some of the main Raw roster has not been trained to death. It looks like, uh, but at NXT still puts on a more professional television program, top to bottom. But so much of their matches are sameness, and their promos are still so heavily scripted that only like an Adam Cole can get away with sounding good. So yeah, all of the wrestling is more of a wrestling program uh, in in flavor, especially of promos and a pacing, than anything WWE's doing, including NXT. Uh, but uh, the, just some of the outlaw talent choices which they are minimizing and like i said maybe they can take constructive criticism so we'll see so it's 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 a horse race uh, at this point and they're bringing on more guys you know who knows what happens with jeff cobb if he comes back and signs a contract Matt- well, after, after his huge splash and victorious debut um maybe he better go away and learn a new hold and come back in six months but but all these guys jeff cobb let's say they bring in lance archer let's say brody lee comes in let's say matt hardy comes in a few more guys matt matt will really pick things up quite a bit him being able to be a little more creative than he's been he's been stifled for a while obviously although sometimes when he is let loose with his creativity things go a bit astray also but the more of these guys that you start signing up and the more other guys that you know potentially the revival and the more of these guys that you bring in, there's going to be less space for some of the outlaw indie shit that gets on the show because you're going to have more. I don't know, but, but, you, but you're also going to have people pulling for outlaw indie shit, such as 93 pound Japanese schoolgirls as champions and or, you know, fucking my little dog pockets. He's a ratings mover. It didn't didn't Tony Khan dress up as my little dog pockets for Halloween or whatever. He certainly did. Yeah. So uh, that's the problem. There have been quality wrestlers that could have replaced this Drek from the start. They never had to use the, the legless man. They never had to use the little fucking hundred pound guy. They didn't have to use the Japanese schoolgirls. They didn't have to use the fucking guys that work with the invisible man, the jelly Nutellas of the world, whatever the fuck. They did it because they were all friends of fucking people that were in a position of authority, which to me, it was malfeasance. There should have been a search for the absolute best athletic talent available. And to a billionaire, a lot of things are available, whether they're under contract or not. And that should have been the product they started presenting. So we wouldn't have had to run them down the fucking road for the past six to nine months about how stupid a lot of their shit was. And we could have concentrated on, wow, these guys at the top, they really know what they're doing. So now they're trying to suck up and make things right. Well, it may just be too late. I may be permanently offended. No, <laughs> but anyway, they're they're trying to rectify it, but I don't know why they were doing it to begin with. Otherwise, then there's just, you know, a bunch of guys who thought I can get all my friends on TV. And there you go. And then we can, and then we can quote Uncle Dave on the fucking package. And the only other thing I would do if I was Tony Khan is insist that Cody Rhodes gets no further tattoos. No, no further tattoos. No tattoos for you. All right. Anyway, you know what's for us? Dinner, finally. (laughs) I'm hungry again, even though I ate my hot dogs. I'm going down to have a pizza now with sausage. I'm having salmon and asparagus. Okay. You know, asparagus will make your piss smell so bad you can't be in in the same room with it. You know that, don't you? I know that it makes your urine smell a certain way. It's not necessarily that bad when I eat it. I don't know what's happening over... And Castle oh, Barnett. I would say just, oh, horrible. Anyway, all right, next week we're going to talk about <laughs> SmackDown and AEW and all. Oh, God, I'm watching a lot of wrestling lately. Anyway, until then, folks, listen to the drive through because we talk about a bunch of stuff that will not make sense if you don't hear the drive through and you listen to next week's experience. We're cross pollinating that way these days. And we'll be back next week for another experience. Until then, for Brian, that pizza-loving guy. Fuck chicken I, wings. Oh, and, and fuck you and fuck chicken wings. We're going to have a fight. Anyway, thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, everybody. I'm going to yell at you off the air.